All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is July 1st, 2023. For my fellow brothers and sisters in Canada, happy Canada Day. Well, today, brothers and sisters, I think this is going to be a, a great video. I know a number of people had asked and we're looking forward to one like this. And I think it's going to be a great follow-up video to this last one about the Shemitah years. In this last one, we were able to, to show to the best of our God-given ability being led through the Spirit and the Word for almost six years, revealing without a hiccup this chart that had the Shemitah year counts and revealed it all the way back to the birth of Christ. Not a single piece out of place. The, the start of Jerusalem was in a Shemitah year. The Leviticus count from when they came into the land in 1948 began their official count of 70 in a Shemitah year. The, the mysteries of Jesus, Jesus about to be, began to be about 30, understood. All of these things revealed through a diligent seeking and searching of the years, searching into the times, searching into the sun, the moon, the stars, coordinating and, and going to other people's studies and seeing their evidence that they teach and they share and travel the world to show brothers and sisters, I believe with my heart that we are here, but I always want to remind you not a single person on earth has ever been told this is the date. It is through discernment. It is through revelation. It is through seeking and searching. But never is it a thus saith the Lord. And I wanted to remind everybody about that. Because you'll remember things like this here when we were sharing in uh, Second Habakkuk a while back and how this writing in Second Habakkuk was about this teacher of righteousness. And even within Habakkuk and, and this prophecy that was given 2,100 years ago, approximately, of, of a person in the end of days who would be like the prophets of old, but not receiving audibles, not receiving dreams, not receiving rev, uh, uh, visions, but would do it through the revelation of the mysteries hidden in Scripture. It was said even of then with Habakkuk, that even though these things were written and would be understood at the time of the end, hello, there was not yet given a date. Or that there was still no when it would begin that would be given. But if we're diligent and we're seeking and we're searching and we're understanding the seasons, the times, we're, 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 we're accounting for time, we're counting the Shemitahs as we've done, we've accounted it all to Scripture, I do believe we're here, but everybody's been wrong for 2,000 years. Does it mean everybody will be wrong forever? Absolutely not. And we've shared many, many things, and so have others, that have connected and helped, people, helped keep people watching and seeking and searching to know that the time is near at hand. And that is what the Holy Ghost has been doing through us here at Ministry Revealed since the moment it started, guys, and especially when I started being aware on uh, September 8th of 2017. So I thought this would be a great video. I have all 70 tabs that are open, and uh, I don't even have enough tabs to open. <laughs> Out of 70 tabs, we're covering 64 of them that I've got here, of all these tabs that are open, and I still didn't have enough room. So we're going to get to this and we're going to do just as I believe the title I'm going to go with is from start to finish. We're going to go from how I believe I see it starting, the events, a lot of things connected within those 50 days. What happens in the end? What happens in the beginning of tribulation? How seals plays out? What happens at the end? How does trumpets take place? What takes place during trumpets to the end of trumpets and then uh, of course, it's the millennial reign and them all receiving their land and so forth. So we're going to take it through the whole gamut. And I just thought it was uh, it was a really good place to put it, considering how close we are, 
right? For anybody that doesn't know, we're looking to June, uh, uh, sorry, July 26th into the 27th of 2023, revealed through scripture in something we had known and understood and sought and searched for years. And it's all about the fifth and the seventh month. However, it begins on the Father God's calendar count, which all began in Taurus. As it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. Whoever finds the be beginning finds the end, for in the beginning there the end shall be. And guess what, brothers and sisters? They shall not taste of death. It's exciting, guys. It is so, so exciting. And I'm hoping we're going to be able to reach even more because uh, I had mentioned in the last video I was contacted by um, by a podcast, um, Tribulation Radio Now, or tri sorry, Tribulation Now Radio. They have, you know, a few thousand, sometimes into the tens of thousands of listeners uh, worldwide, and they gave me my date. I'm going to be on, on uh, Wednesday, July 12th from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to post it again in the forum. I'll talk about it again in other videos until that time. Uh, I'll bring it up as well. But I will post it in the forum as the time comes. And um, it'll be essentially an hour of me sharing the revelation of the Gospels and the years and just kind of laying out a lot of the, 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 the starting ground to help people see and understand how this revelation came about uh, in relation to the Gospels, the years, and how to understand them. And so I'll have essentially an hour to just start sharing everything. Uh, the main guy, John, will jump in and, and ask things along the way. And then I was told that there's going to be uh, call-ins from people around the world, and it'll be about an hour, two hours of call-ins, uh, questions back and forth. So I'm up for as long as it goes, as you guys know. Uh, but I looked at some of their other ones, and they go anywhere from two and a half maybe even up to three and a half hours so it's kind of right in our wheelhouse right no problem doing three hours in uh, in sharing the revelation and helping wake up more people to prepare to the time to understand and maybe even wake up some more to that remnant worker bride so really exciting stuff guys super interesting and I'm always excited to do it. I always that little bit of nervous anticipation at the beginning, almost like going on stage, you know. I've told you guys that many times. Even when I come to start these videos, I'm so flooded. Like, I, I've got 60-some tabs open for this video, and it's not enough. But I was going to do it just blind. I was just going to bang and do it because I don't even need the tabs. That's how crazy it is. So who knows if I'll actually be going to each and every one of those tabs. But hopefully I will to keep some of the order that I wanted. But, um, you know, it, it's incredible, man. The spirit is leading. The time is close. The events are happening. And guys, I want to say thank you for everybody who is praying over the ministry and over each other, who is who who are interceding for those who are out there doing things right, who are interceding, who are supporting as well. And I really need to emphasize the support because you guys know our brother Steve. And the company, the guy that owns this printing press in Uganda, Steve and his team with him are traveling throughout Uganda and area, and they are sharing the word of God. They are sharing Bibles to those that haven't received them. They're sharing all the ministry revealed books like you see here. They're giving these things away. And we are a major, if not the major, I believe we're the only support, like the major support. Uh, and the only support for our brother Steve and his mission that he's doing out there in Uganda. And brothers and sisters, they are feeding the poor. They are spreading the gospel. They're sharing the revelation. They're, they're helping the children. They're, they're filling people with understanding and helping them to see the scriptures and to understand them better as they read. They're providing shoes. They're doing all sorts of things, brothers and sisters. And the only way that that happens is mainly through the support here. I know some people through the ministry support them directly, and it's a little bit tricky if people want to do that. They absolutely can do that. They can contact me or they can contact Steve in the forum. But the easiest way is we have a PayPal button and a GoFundMe button. On top of that, if people are asking where to support or how to find the info, 
you can support us right here on the YouTube channel. There's the GoFundMe link. There's the PayPal link. But under every video, we have right here, you go to the description box. You click more under the description box in the videos. There's the PayPal link. There's the GoFundMe link. And here's the info for anybody that wants to send anything in the mail. So one of the reasons I'm bringing this up now as well is because Steve um, is about to go do another mission. They're going out. It's a whole conference taking place. If I'm not mistaken, there's pro I believe there's even thousands of people that are going to be there. It might even go into the tens of thousands. So it's not that we're going to be able to provide all of these books for everybody. We're not going to be able to, the, to feed and, and to do everything that's needed for everybody. But I want to do as much as we can, guys. So when the, when the support comes in, it has to hit my account. And when it hits my account, I transfer chunks to Steve at a time. And the reason I do it is for him to be able to manage it and because of the, of the source that we use to uh, transfer the funds to him. They are instant, by the way, guys. Just so you know, when I transfer the funds to Steve, he has them instantly. All right, like within a minute or two, when I transfer it, I let him know it's been transferred and he's off to the races, paying for printing, buying Bibles, buying food, setup, supplies, travel. All right, so I wanted to put that out there because you guys have been so generous with your support, with your prayers, and with your intercessions. We always need that to continue. We don't need much here in our house, but we, we do have also brothers and sisters here in this ministry that I've been receiving messages from that are really struggling right now and need help with some bills and so forth. So there is that as well. So we also want to try and take care of our own backyard of brothers and sisters here too. So with that, guys, I appreciate it. I always appreciate it. I'm always so, so grateful. And I can't wait to see what's going to be done. I can't wait to see the reward of what is taking place in Uganda and with Steve and not what I'm doing, but what we are collectively all doing. It's a beautiful thing, guys. I would not have thought this in a million lifetimes if I was given a million lifetimes. I mean, I was an entrepreneur. You guys know my story. I, I still pinch myself and shake my head sometimes because I, 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 I still, still can't believe it. It's a wild thing. So with that, let me share something uh, before I go to the intro portion. Let me share something that was shared by one of our brothers uh, in Florida. I've mentioned him a few times, Dennis, our brother Dennis shared me some info that he found in a comment on somebody's video and it was about king charles and we all know king charles you know he was quite the activist and he said when he became king he would be less of an activist well it turns out king charles is still quite the activist and he came out and he unveiled what he calls the climate clock and he did it with the mayor of london he did it let me show you this he did it on May 28th. He said, when they push this climate clock, they call this climate clock, they call it the, 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 the countdown of doom, or they count it the, uh, um, the, the catastrophic tipping point on Earth. How funny that was, right? Sorry, give me one sec. Could you imagine, guys? They push this clock on, you're going to love this. Some of you guys are going to freak out if you've been here in the ministry for a while. They push this clock on, sorry, June 28th, 2023, and proclaimed that we had six years and 24 days remaining before absolute catastrophe would be on the earth. Hello. Can you say, holy beep? Come on, guys, he's giving us uh, down to the days? I thought, this is absurdity. How could this be? So when I had asked our, our brother for, you know, where is the article? I was like, I'll, I'll just go look for it, right? I couldn't believe it. Let me show you guys something, and you'll understand why it's freaky. They made this 
on they made this happen they did this on june 28th of 2023 for which they said you ready for this for which they said on june 28th 2023 there was six years and 24 days do you guys know that in six years and 24 days from now is july 29th uh, sorry is july 22nd 2029 you may say okay oh well, what does that really matter well let me show you something for anybody that's been watching for a little while what do we know the seventh sabbath day count ends at the eighth of Av, and then the 50 days begin right what is this entire period right here this entire connection is about the first attack on Israel that relates to the ninth of Av. Okay? What else do we know? Well, for the Jews, if the ninth of Av falls on a Sabbath, then they observe it on the 10th, which would be on the Sunday. Okay? So everybody that looks into these things understands that. <clears throat> we know that the above 14 years is going to kick off everything on the ninth of Av, for which we're gonna cover and go into these things today and go into the whole storyline that will begin right here. All right? What do you think six years and 24 days from now is? Well, let's go have a look. Let's go to July 22nd, 2029. What do you get? The ninth of Av. Remember, it's on a Sabbath, so they observe it over here. What is the whole story of the ninth of Av? It's from about the seventh to the tenth. He said six years and 24 days. And it just so happens to land on the day from the beginning of the pre trib escape. Do you know why this is extra interesting for us? Because we know that the truth of the end of days isn't seven years of tribulation. We know the truth is the revelation of 14 years, which of course throughout this we will touch on tonight. For anybody that's new to the ministry, this is where I'm now going to show you. If you're new and you're saying, you're going to hear me talk about this difference of who the Gospels are speaking to, you're going to hear me talking about this 14 years and a period of time above 14 years. There's two places you can get the understanding of it to begin to understand it. On YouTube, come to the playlist right here. <laughs> That's a close-up of our brother Steve. This is the playlist right here, and come to this one right here. The Revealed End Time Study Note Series. Click on this. Gospels. Ah, no commercial this time. Thank you. And you're going to come to this playlist right here. This first video is a 22-minute video that will introduce these next three videos. You're going to begin to understand, in this overview, the revelation of a 30-minute Bible study to begin to help you understand the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. You're going to see that Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the end of days with the Synoptic Gospels is Luke, Mark, and Matthew. You're going to see that Jesus was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, beautiful. You're going to see in Mark, he was arrayed in purple. In Matthew, he was arrayed in scarlet. And we know that the tribulation colors is white for the bride of Christ, not tribulation. We know purple and scarlet are tribulation colors that the woman riding the beast has. <clears throat> you see, it will all start to come to be revealed to you, but it all begins with a 30-minute Bible study. That's all we ask. Just start with these first four videos. This will set you up to understand. This will lead you into the understanding of who the Gospels are speaking to. And once you begin to understand who the Gospels are speaking to, you're going to say, oh my goodness, that's probably why there's three different discourses. Luke's is very different than Mark's and Matthew's, but Mark's and Matthew's are still also very different from each other. And so much so, most people don't realize that Matthew's discourse isn't only Matthew chapter 24, it's also Matthew chapter 25. So they are all very different from each other. And once you begin who, to understand who the Gospels are speaking to, you will see this understanding of 14 years and this portion called above. Then you're going to say, how on earth over all of these centuries did we miss it? 
The answer is found in the fourth big video, almost three hours long, called It's All Because of Matthew. In there, you're going to see, because we have all been taught from the Gospel of Matthew, everybody's foundational understanding, whether they realize it or not, and really nobody does, they've all looked to everything. In the epistles, when they go to the Old Testament, everything they see, unbeknownst to them, has a focus of only a seven-year period of time. And that seven-year period of time is Matthew's seven years of Jacob's trouble, which is the seven years of trumpets, not the seven years of seals that belong to the world. The house of Israel, the Gentiles grafted in. Once you understand that, oh my goodness, it's going to blow your mind because you're going to understand things like pre- mid and post, they're all true. Luke is pre, Mark is mid, Matthew is post. You're going to see the discourse is revealed. You're going to understand so many incredible revelations. And one of the places, since you're on YouTube, most likely watching this, you can simply just come to that playlist here on YouTube. The other place you can go is here on Ministry Revealed. You can go to the menu and you can go into the intro. And when you come into the intro, you're going to see the same thing. There's the intro video. <clears throat> There's the Gospels, 14 years. It's all because of Matthew. And then you can go deeper once you've started to grasp those. And you can go into the big revelation. This is a big three-hour video on the intro to the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. This is a big three-hour video on it. From there, you can see the differences in the discourses revealed. <clears throat> pre, mid, post, all of it. It gets so crazy. There's even a part where it says, now, now it's big time, right? Now it's going to take you all the way back to the beginning of creation and reveal to you that everything is a fractal. From the beginning of creation to the end of day's revelation, the entire story is a big story of the little story excuse me, of the end of days. It is absolutely trippy. It is, it's going to blow your mind. It will take you hours <laughs> and hours and days to go through this. But if you ask anybody here in Ministry Revealed who has, who, who came across the ministry and it started to click and things started to make sense, I know hundreds of people in the ministry who stopped everything that they were doing and spent a weekend watching video after video after video, seeking it out, searching it for themselves, taking notes and everything else, guys. It is worth it. I promise you, it's worth every moment of your time. All right? So with that, let me show you what we were talking about with Prince Charles and how this will also lead us in, because it's definitely going to be a part of tonight's topic, and how this period of time that leads us into 2029 at, at uh, the 9th of Av time frame, why it's a big deal. Because once you understand that the tribulation is truly 14 years long, it is two sets of seven, when you realize that when the tribulation begins, not at the pre-trib escape, but when that above portion is finished and the 14 years truly officially begins, it will begin with the destruction of Jerusalem, an attack on Jerusalem, which we're going to cover. When that attack on Jerusalem happens, that is going to be the beginning of World War III. That is the, that is, you could say it's the opening scene. It's not really the opening scene. When you see what we're going to talk about in the things that happen first, in the first 50 days, in the above portion, you'll understand that's not the opening scene. But you're going to understand that it's at World War III and at the destruction of Jerusalem and them being removed from the land for seven years before the rebuilding of the temple could take place because they've been disobedient in the land the land must rest for seven years. So when he says 24 days, six years and 24 days, what is he saying happens? Climate devastation, climate apocalypse is what some people are calling it in the media. 
Do you know what six years and 24 days is from now? It's somewhere in the range of the end of the six years of seals. It's the time frame of the end of the sixth year of seals. How about we read what it says and see if maybe King Charles knows some things that we have also come to understand. But I believe it is a setup on their end by declaring this period of time. Why? Because we know who's coming at the end of the sixth seal. And so they want to make it seem like it was all this man stuff and everything else that destruction is coming from above. Let's see what the sixth seal that's going to happen in six years from now, a little less than six years, once the tribulation begins. Let's see what's going to happen. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun was black as sackcloth of hair, of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Now listen to this. Verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled up together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. The kings of the earth hid, the great men and rich men, the chief captains, mighty men, every bondman and every free man hid themselves in dens and in the rocks of the mountains. You see, absolute chaos is going to be raining down on the earth. You know, it, it kind of baffles me to think that it would be you would that they would try to make this a deception for six years into seals you see what this does this gives this adds to the excitement of knowing that the time is at hand in my opinion because this apocalyptic catastrophic devastation coming in the time frame he said is literally the time towards the end of the six years of the first six years of seals. And look at what it talks about. How on earth can anybody be so deceived by that point to think that it was because of, of the devastation of men? Right? Be, because of their lack of climate change. We know what it is, guys. It's the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion. Right? Verse 16 and 17. And said unto the rock, unto the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? You see? You know, one of the other things, um, I think it was our sister Trisha in the forum that made a really good comment because you know what the biggest mystery is, guys? It's not the great multitude mid trib rapture. Because the great multitude mid-trib rapture is what everybody thinks is coming first. The mystery is the pre-trib, smaller group of people, arrayed in white, spirit-filled, diligently seeking, loving and repentant people that are about to vanish before it all begins. That's the greater mystery. You see, it's almost like Everybody points to this period of time. Everybody, because they only understand seven years because they look through Matthew. Do you think it's any different with the, with the royals? With the church? With the seminaries? Absolutely not. That's where they all learn it from. They're all stuck in a seven-year thinking. And so it's almost as if because it's still such a mystery that it's 14 and not seven to the world you've got king charles talking about this period of time and coming in about six years like it would be blamed on them not realizing that there is the seven year period that begins it all and this is actually at the end of the sixth year of seals only six years in to the total 14 years. You see what I'm saying? That's kind of the point she was making. Like, like we would be here. Like nothing would happen. War would take place. These events of the sixth year towards the end of the sixth year of seals would take place and it would, they would be able to blame it on man. 
Why, why even bother putting that out like that? I think, like she said, because they don't realize either that it's 14 years. They don't understand the mystery of the pre-trib of a smaller 10% of, the, of believers going who are the true spirit-filled ones. That's what I think is going on here. Awesome, awesome stuff. All right, let's, let's now jump into this. And let's go right off the bat. Once the, for those that have been around for a while, you know this, but where it all started for Ministry Revealed was this revelation of the Gospels. And we'll touch on it once we get to that point. But it was, that was in early September, September 8th of 2017 that it began. And by late September or into October, I think it was into October, I then came across this piece of scripture. And when people don't have end time eyes, they look at it and they're like, oh, this is Paul. What are you talking about? It's not a future thing. Paul did this. Paul did that at that time and this. What people fail to see is that prophecy is all throughout Scripture from beginning to end. And they just completely miss it. And one of the biggest reasons, it's like what we call end time eyes. You know, you, you have to begin with the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to to be able to see and understand exactly what he is prophetically talking about here <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Because everybody loves to go to this one. Was caught up into paradise. <clears throat> because this, as we'll talk about later, is the great multitude rapture in chapter 7 of Revelation after the sixth year of seal, it seals. It takes place in the seventh year of seals. You see, what does he say starting in verse 2? I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. There's a whole bunch. This piece of scripture right here, this portion of one verse, it, 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 it's, it's, it, it's the whole revelation. It's like the whole opening gamut of the whole story of tribulation. Those who are in Christ are about to go like, such as one means like, a rapture to the third heaven. Not everybody, not the next group that is such a man, meaning like the first one, but not really. Why? Because the ones that were in Christ are the ones that are in Christ spirit-filled, as Romans 8 talks about. Well, what does it say about this group that is that Paul has given us in a typology here of himself? Who, who is this group in Christ and above 14 years ago. Well, for those that have been around, you know that it relates to a pre-group, it relates to a mid-group, and it relates to him saying, behold, I am, uh, behold, the third time, I am ready to come to you. You see, what do you have? You have a taking, a caught up to the third heaven, you have a caught up to paradise, and then you have the return, him coming to you. Guys, it is everywhere throughout Scripture. So what is this in Christ above 14 years ago? <clears throat> okay? That's where we're really going to get started here. In this above 14 years ago, I have come to believe, and you're going to see why I do, that something is going to happen to a chosen group of people probably recognized as little flock who i also believe are the connection to first peter chapter 1 verse 5 those who the lord has reserved for the time of the end who have a place reserved for them in heaven who will come to see the lord and in this revelation of the lord being chosen to be his servants they will have faith no more you see, they will have no more need for faith because they will have been in his presence. They are a group who are to be a part of the pre-trib, what we call escape. The pre-trib rapture, we call the escape. That pre-trib escape group that's supposed to, or that is going to go, there is a remnant group who is who are going to be his servants and they relate to a group which is the church of Smyrna as his workers, okay? 
who will put their lives on the line to spread the gospel and the revelation and to pray and to prepare people in Christ to either die, if need be, to, to avoid the mark during seals, or for when he comes at the time of the rapture. And it's going to be during a time of the greatest revival in human history in the midst of the greatest chaos in human history. Okay? So how does this above portion begin? Right here in Luke chapter 12, verse 35. This, I believe, is a portion of people being informed before it all begins. So if we're looking at everything beginning right here in this time frame right here, this is the seventh Sabbath. This is the beginning of the 50 days. So at the escape of the bride of Christ, depending where you are in the world, I believe shortly before it, I don't know if it's two days before, I don't know if it's a day, I don't know if it's an hour or five minutes before. But what I believe is going to happen is right here. It says in Luke chapter 12, verse 35, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knock, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. This group right here is what we call the Smyrna Remnant Worker Group Bride. They are the Luke 24, two on the road to Emmaus, who I believe the two represent the portion of the good side of Dan and Ephraim who are missing from the 144. I believe there are two sets of 12,000 who will be the ones sent out to start this entire period of time. But this right here, I believe is the Lord telling them right before it happens. You see, in verse 36, it says, And you yourselves, like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. So he's pre telling them before he's gone to the wedding. We know the rest of this, you know, in verse 38 and down. Uh, but in verse 38 in specific, it says, And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are those servants. You see, there's two more watches. The first one is the remnant workers from Luke. The second one is the 144,000 at the end of Mark's portion of seals. They're going to help these guys bring in the great multitude rapture because a lot of these guys will have already been killed. And the third watch is the group that will work during the millennial reign at the end of Matthew, they're called the 12. So what do you have? Three different groups over the seals time, the trumpets time, and then during the millennial reign. And this revelation is found in the understanding of the last chapter of the gospel of Luke, the last chapter of the gospel of Mark, and the last chapter of the gospel of Matthew about halfway or so down. When, when it comes to the, um, uh, 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 their commission and what they're to do. You know, if you ever go read those commissions and what, they are, what they're told to do, they are vastly, vastly different from each other. But our focus in the above is this group right here. So I believe he's going to come and reveal himself, I don't know how, through, as an angel of the Lord, uh, <laughs> through sending out his angels, I have no idea. But I believe through that revelation in that verse, in those verses and chapters, and chapter, he's going to make known to his remnant worker bride what is about to take place. Okay, what else do we know about this period of time? And, and what is this period of time? For anybody that doesn't know, as I had mentioned a little bit at the beginning, this is the beginning of the 50 days. This period of time that begins on the 9th of Av 
is the beginning of the 50 day period of time, which is called above 14 years. That's why I started there. It's the above 14 years, and it takes us to the last day of the Jewish year, which is the 29th of Elul. That is the 50th day. And you see, bang, the attack will come. We'll cover that. Okay, so it is this 50 day period of time, but we're still talking the beginning. <clears throat> so right before or shortly before the escape happens, a group will be instructed and informed because you have to think about this. If you've been watching, praying, diligent, loving, repentant, right? You would expect there's, there's no reason for you to be left behind, you would think, right? So we always have to be in these things. We've always got to be diligent. We've always got to be seeking the Lord and spending time with him in Scripture. That's how you get to know him is through Scripture. Not 30 minutes at church on Sunday. It's through the relationship in drawing closer to him by studying the letters he left you to, to come to understand and know him. You see? So if you're doing these things, you love the Lord, you would expect that, of course, you know, if there's a pre-trib, I'm hoping and praying to go. You see? So what would happen if you were left and you had no understanding as to why you were left, but tens of millions of people in the pre-trib were taken? You'd freak out, right? <clears throat> imagine, imagine how others that just go to church on Sunday and, and okay, occasionally ask the Lord for things in a prayer. They maybe have heard about the rapture and they'll say, that couldn't have been the rapture, I'm still here. But what about for those who are diligently seeking? Lord, Lord, what happened? I believe that's that group right here that will be informed. Everybody else freaking out will be part of the left behind. All right. So now when this group is informed, look at what happens when we go to Luke chapter 14. We see there's the story of the wedding feast. After the wedding feast, you have the story of a great banquet. Well, in Matthew's gospel and in Mark's gospel, you have no wedding. There is no wedding. There's no wedding feast. There's no, there's no uh, banquet mention or anything like that. But in Matthew's, there is. And we know this is the relation to, to Leah and Rachel. We know that there are two weddings that will take place. We see the wedding in the story of Jacob towards the end of, right at the end of set, the first seven years. Then he, he gets Leah after the one week wedding. Uh, he's got Leah. Then he gets Rachel, but he has to serve seven more years. What's interesting about that is there's no story of a wedding to Rachel. It's kind of interesting, right? And then of course you have the other six years that he works for cattle. Well, that first seven years, that first seven years that we're, that we're in right now, let me show you what that is. Actually, we can even show it from this awesome chart. You see, the revelation of the end of days is seven, seven, and seven. This was the quote unquote easy seven years that Jacob worked. He was so excited, he was so in love that they flew by like days, okay? Then he gets Leah, but he was expecting Rachel. He has a seven day wedding with Leah, and then he's also given Rachel, for which he then has to work seven more years. Following? At the end of those seven years, he stays six more years for a total of what? For a total of 20 years from when he started. What is that time? That works out to the end of the 13th year of tribulation, the end of the sixth year of trumpets, and is what? When the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. We're going to show you all this. We're going to show you this connection with the 13 as well and who's, who's a part of it and, and what this, after that 13 years, what happens in that 14th final year. You see, but that's the picture, <coughs> excuse me, that's going on. And what do we know? There's a Leah wedding, the Gentile bride, right? And then what happens at the end? What happens at the end of 14 years? Well, 
these represent the seven days as years as unleavened bread. They're called the bread of affliction. These represent the seven years as the seven days of tabernacles. And what is the eighth day of tabernacles? The new beginning, the final jubilee. What happens at the end of the 14 years of tribulation? There's going to be a seven day wedding. That's exactly what you get in Matthew chapter 25. But what happens is everybody, because their focus is always in Matthew, they have no understanding that what they're actually pointing to with the foolish and the wise virgins and all of that has zero to do with pre-trib and 100% to do with the end of the 14th year. It's the story that all Jews know about that you can, the, you know, I've got a young son who's maybe two and somebody, a best friend has his daughter just born. And we go into an agreement that when they're of age, they're, when she's of age, they're going to get married. They make an agreement. And at 13 years, see, like 13 years of seals, right? Seven of seals, six of trumpets. At the end of 13 years, she's of age. The contract becomes binding. They're married, but they, it's, it's a preparation time. He goes away. He prepares for that final year. That's Matthew chapter 20. Well, that's actually the end of Matthew. And then Matthew 25 is the end of the 14th year, the end of that final 14th year where the place has been prepared. She's been readying herself, getting all set up for that one year. And then the Lord returns. And when the Lord returns, what is it? There's the shofar blast. The sun has returned and the great wedding is now going to take place. When does that wedding take place? It takes place at the end of the 14th year for seven days. How did it start? A wedding for seven days. And when it's all over, a wedding for seven days. One is the Gentile, one is the Jew. You see, guys, it's all here. The whole story is laid out in order. It's absolutely incredible. So what about this one that we're talking about now in the above portion? This is why you have the wedding in Luke, not in Mark, and then you have it in Matthew. And why Matthew's is also directly correlated to the end of the 14 years. That's why it's in chapter 25 when the tribulation is done. It's crazy. So what do we know about this wedding feast? Well, of course, this one is also very different than Mark's, uh, than Matthew's and what it talks about. So it talks about when you are bidden in verse 8, in Luke 14, verse 8. When thou art bidden of, bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. Okay, so this is something we've talked about many times. Don't go sit. When you're taking pre-trib, anybody listening to my voice, if pre-trib hasn't happened yet, and you're taken in the pre-trib and you're not a remnant worker, do not go sit down in the highest room in your excitement when you get to the third heaven. Go to the lowest room. You don't want to be embarrassed by somebody more honorable coming and getting that seat and them telling you to move down lower. Okay? Don't be put to shame, but go to the lowest room. Okay? And if somebody comes and gets you and calls you friend to bring you higher up, Hallelujah. Okay, this right here, this parable of the wedding feast is the pre-trib Gentile bride of Christ taken to the third heaven. That is the literal story of what's going on here. And I have prayerfully said this enough times so that everybody knows when you get there, we were the ones that heard it, right? We understood the scripture that told us to go to the lowest room. All right. But then listen to what happens after that wedding. There's the parable of the great banquet. Matthews doesn't have the parable of the great banquet. Listen to what it listen to what this one says, starting in verse 12. Then said he also. Then said he also to him that bade him, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends nor nor thy brethren neither thy kinsmen nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again and a recompense be made thee. 
But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed, listen to this, at the resurrection of the just. So there's a group that gets to take part in the resurrection of the just. Well, that's pretty fascinating, isn't it? Because did you notice there wasn't a conversation here about a group that was worthy to be taken? Do you know why? Because they were already taken. Hello. This is the pre-trib. Those who were counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. That's this group right here. This is the pre-trib at the beginning of 50 days after he has informed another group when he's coming back to be ready. This is the wedding. So you don't need those who are counted worthy to be mentioned because they're already gone. So who are the only ones mentioned? Those who will be part of the resurrection of the just. Who are those who take part in the resurrection of the just? The remnant worker bride who is Smyrna. You see, <clears throat> this great banquet is the banquet that the Lord himself is going to have with that worker group that remained in Luke chapter 12. This banquet is the banquet for this group right here, those who were part of what's called the first watch. You see, then the second, then the third. So obviously they're the first. Who is this group that was ready in the first watch? The hint and the clue to it is, well, we just discovered it, right? We've known it for a while, but we just talked about it. Those who were taken to the wedding, these guys know now to wait for when he returns from the wedding. And when he returns from the wedding, what's he going to do? He's going to sit down and serve them. He's going to sit down, eat with them, and serve them. The only of these three groups of the end of Luke, Mark, and Matthew, of the, of the workers of each three periods of time, the only one that he sits down to eat with and serve is the ones from Luke the two typology on the road to Emmaus. And in Luke 24, 30, he says, and it came to pass as he sat at meat with them. You see, this is the only one where he sits to eat with them. He took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to them. He sat down, ate with them and served them. He only does it in Luke's worker portion. You see, this is that banquet. This is the typology. This is the mystery of the is to come revelation in who the gospels are speaking to of Luke's portion. That remnant worker bride Smyrna, when he has that banquet meal with them, who are the remnant ones who who have this meal with the lord well you guys all know this that have been around for a while what did it say it said they will be those who were a part of the resurrection of the just what does it say about those related to smyrna who are going to put their necks on the line it says he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death you see that's the smyrna group this is the beginning of the 40 days. So this is after now the seven day wedding. The Lord returns on the eighth day. The wedding now is over. He's returned on the eighth day. The son of man is here. He's gonna be doing signs, wonders, all sorts of things after he has this banquet with them. We were told that those who had this banquet and that would do these things would be part of the resurrection of the just. We know that those who are part of the resurrection of the just are those who will not be hurt of the second death. And we read about it in Revelation chapter 20 when he's talking about returning and now the millennial reign beginning. Listen to what he says. It says, but the rest of the dead, which lived not again uh, until the thousand years were over, uh, were finished. Oh, let me start up here. Okay. Those who did not take the mark, those that were beheaded for him, right? Did not take the mark or anything. 
and they lived and reigned a thousand years with them. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are, were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. But they shall pre be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Who are they? Clearly the ones as Smyrna who will not be hurt of the second death. You see, every single part of this is correlated so that when we went to see what happened after this accounted worthy group is taken, we see that he's having the banquet with those who will be part of putting their necks on the line and will take part in the resurrection of the just. How can we prove this group here is the pre-trib and this group here as the remnant workers? Well, we know this one quite well as well. Let's go to Luke chapter 22. And in it, Luke chapter 22 or Luke 22? Uh, uh, Luke 20. Dun, 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 dun. No, Luke chapter 20. I was going on both sides. I was doing this this afternoon. I was 22 and then I go, there. no, 21. No, the other one is 22. This one's 20. Okay. We all know this story. Okay. The story about at the resurrection, you know, she married seven husbands. One died, the next one, the next one. Who's she going to be married when she goes to heaven? And we see that the children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be, listen to this, accounted worthy to obtain that world. And you see this? Comma and. For those that are new to the ministry, you want to watch the video in that series called Comma and. It's something so beautiful, it's going to blow your mind because most of us throughout forever have just read through these things as if they mean nothing. Like if there's no and there, then it doesn't really mean anything. Well, it couldn't be further from the truth, okay? It means a separation in addition to, means that there's an accounted worthy group, which is one group, and the other group is those who are the resurrection of the dead. I told you I'd show you both. Luke 21, verse 35, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world. Who are the accounted worthy? They're the ones from Luke 21, 36. Watch and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. This is the pre-trib group, spirit-filled in Christ going above 14 years, going to the third heaven. This is the group that we're saying, sit down in the lowest room. And if somebody comes to you and says, hey, you're more honorable, come on up higher, then go up higher. That's this group right here, the accounted worthy group. But there's another group, and it is those who will be part of the resurrection of the dead. I just showed you in Luke chapter, 12, uh, Luke chapter 14, the difference between those two groups the one that is at the wedding and the other one that is received at the banquet when the Lord returns from the wedding. That is the revelation of what is about to take place. If we've understood finally the year and we're coming to the end of 70, the end of seven, okay? Watch this. He tells them, he takes the, then he takes the pre-trib group the seven-day wedding is taking place. Then he returns after the wedding on the eighth day. On the date when he returns at some time on the eighth day, he is going to gather that group and have a meal with them somewhere, wherever he deems fit, which means whoever the remnant workers are, they're going to be translated just like Philip was. That's pretty wild to think, right? Well, you want to know what's already wild to think? If you're a remnant worker bride, your life is not your own anymore. Everything on planet Earth is about to change, and you're going to be informed about it slightly before it happens. And then tens of millions of people are going to vanish and the 50 days will have begun. 
That's the wedding fest. Uh, that's the wedding banquet right there, the wedding feast. This on the eighth day is the wedding banquet with the Smyrna group, that remnant Smyrna Luke twenty four group, Luke twelve group, who were ready and prepared for when he returned from the wedding. That's them. Okay, so there's some seriously exciting and and deep revelation that's taking place in this time. But that's not all that's taking place. Okay? That's one part of the events that are taking place. Let me show you another event that's also going to be taking place. The question with this event is, are we going to see this event right before the escape happens? Or is it going to be seen at the escape Right? It might it be seen a day or two before the escape? Or is it kind of at the time of the escape? We're seeing it come down and then bang, the escape happens. And what is this thing that I'm talking about? I'm, of course, talking about the stone's throw. The stone's throw or the stone's cast, when Jesus says, when he was kneeling down, right, before he's come and taken away, he says that he's a stone's cast or a stone's throw away. It is a very strange piece of wording to say unless you have some revelation because the Lord is the only one who can cast the stone, right? That's what we read in Luke as well. In Luke chapter, uh, sorry, in John chapter eight, we've covered it many times. John's gospel has a, has a picture of 21 chapters as an image of the 21 years. So. What do we see at the beginning of chapter 8, right? The beginning of this storyline. We see that here he's saying he's a stone's throw away. So when we look at this as a stone's throw and we see that it's about what? Two and a half or so days before his resurrection, which starts Luke chapter 24. The question is, is it going to be uh, let me let me use the calendar. The question is, is it going to be that we're going to see it right before everything starts, about two and a half days before the, the escape? Or is it that the stone's throw is going to be about two and a half days away? Okay. Is it going to be two and a half days away to when he's coming uh, to start his 40 days after the wedding? That's still kind of up in the air, although I've leaned more recently that we're going to see it at the beginning. And you're going to understand why as we continue to go through this a little bit more as well. Because this stone's throw, which which is a very big deal. And let me go to John 8 just to show you. In John chapter 8, this wording that we have right here is the wording that we have at the end of Luke's discourse. So when he says, watch and pray always that you be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. It then says, and then he went to the Mount of Olives and they went early in the morning to sit down and to listen to him. So if this is the same typology of now the escape happening, what's happened, then there's your woman in adultery, which just is another definition you could say for a Gentile bride. Right. They were adulterers. They were dogs. They were called all sorts of things as Gentiles. And we see this Gentile woman being brought to him. We have this picture of the wedding taking place. And then they say, oh, we want a stoner. We want a stoner. And of course, Jesus says him that was out, only he that it was out. Sorry, without sin, let him cast a stone at her. So there's only one who can cast the stone. Whether this is a picture of already being in heaven or whether it's a picture of, of just before he rescues her is the question, but I think we're going to still get more clarity because like I said, I think it's just right as things are about to begin that we would see the stone's throw and as it's seen, bang, the escape happens. So here he is. Who is the only one without sin? Jesus is the only one without sin. He's the only one that can cast a stone at her, okay? And then they all feel convicted. They walk away, and Jesus is left alone. 
and the woman standing in the midst. Remember standing before the Son of Man? He lifted himself up like he was bent on a knee, like a, like a proposal, like he was there before her. Okay? And then we see the typology of the 40 days of the Son of Man beginning. Him coming back eight days on the eighth day after the seven days of the wedding. When he comes to say he is the light of the world to shine his light in the darkness. This is a picture of the Son of Man beginning the 40 days. This is a picture of what appears to happen either right before the seven days or the 50 days begin and the wedding starts or sometime in the midst of it. Okay, so there it is again. Two places where we've got this picture of a stone's throw and in no other place in, within the Gospels do you have that stone's throw with the relation to uh, um, uh, Jesus saying he's a stone's throw away. You see, this is the mystery that we talk about in the differences in the Gospels. When you understand these differences, the, the, the scriptures will mind-blowingly open up to you as you have never understood them before. And you'll realize that the entire storyline built into it is a layer under the layer, and it's all prophecy. It's all prophecy. So now, what is this stone's throw, and why do I believe that we would see the stone's throw before, at least before he comes back on the eighth day? So either right near the beginning of the seven days or before the eighth day when he returns. So we're not talking about a long period of time. We're saying that we'll see the stone's throw anywhere between here and here. If this is the year, whatever that 50 is about to begin, this is something that is going to be seen within this period of time, within that first seven days of, of everything beginning. Let me show you and let me prove to you a little bit more what I mean. If you go to the book of Revelation and you go to chapter 2, you see, Smyrna... And, and the representation of Smyrna, which is those, that group that we just talked about, their representation is at the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man, when he returns from the wedding. Now, does he meet with them before everything starts? Yes, he briefly, briefly meets with them before it all starts. But once he comes after the wedding, to sit down and eat with them and serve them and all that stuff. It's the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man in the portion still called the above portion of the 14 years. Okay? They're going to follow him for the 40 days. And then we'll go into the rest of these things that they will do afterwards. And that'll take us into the tribulation years. So what happens though first? Well, the first part that comes is Ephesus. So Ephesus and the representation of Ephesus, you see, this here, the eighth day, after the seven-day wedding, this eighth day is the conversation to Smyrna, to the Luke 24 remnant worker bride portion. But Ephesus is the beginning of the 50 days until the end of the seven days. And this is all about the apostles. So there are also going to be modern day apostles that are going to be walking the earth again as well. Their representation is John chapter 20. Okay? Their representation is John chapter 20. So what you get is in Luke chapter 24, in Luke chapter 24, he does two things. We know that he informs his, the, remnant worker, uh, the remnant worker bride. They're going to be informed. And then this right here is the pre-trib bride of Christ. In Luke chapter 24, 3, it says, And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Okay, Who is his body but his bride? This is why you don't find this in the other Gospels at the resurrection story. <clears throat> you don't find the body, the word the body, being gone. 
And then it says, and they were much perplexed. That's what's going to happen, right? They're going to be caught in the snare. The world that's left, they're going to be freaking out. The word perplexed, that's what it's all about. We've shared on this a number of times <coughs> in the story from 2 Esdras chapter 13, when the Most High delivered those who were on the earth and bewilderment of mind came over those uh, uh, came over those who dwelt on the earth, and then they planned to make war against each other. Then Red Horse Rider stuff starts, okay? It's the same. The body's gone. They were bewildered. The body is gone. They were perplexed. That's just, it's a synonymous name with it. So he meets with them. The escape happens. And when the escape happens, he also, you'll see right here, he actually tells um tells uh, uh mary magdalene don't touch me i haven't yet ascended to the father so we know the escape the bride is gone but the lord you see then says he came back on the same day at evening what is the story of john this is the beginning of the 50 days the 50 days have now started and what does he do well he meets with them and he breathes on this apostle group who will receive this exceptional power of the Holy Ghost. They're going to go out while the wedding is going on in heaven. They're going to be the ones sent out to begin to wake the world up and do whatever it is they got to do. They're going to remain during seals as well. But this focus is on this first seven days to the eighth day while the wedding is taking place. This is the group. The apostles are the ones who are going to receive that breathed on at the beginning of 50 after the pre-trib escape. And they're going to work during the wedding. While what happens? While the disciples, Luke group, are, are staying in their homes, are, are remaining somewhere girded about, protected, watching, waiting for the Lord's return and for him to come and knock. Okay. Then what do we see? Then the Lord comes again after eight days. When he comes again after eight days, this is when he goes to the Luke 24 guys that we see down here, those two on the road to Emmaus. And what does he do? As we know the story, he sits down and eats with them. So what is it then that's happening during these eight days? What, what's this connection to the stone's throw with these guys? Well. For those of you who haven't seen past videos, Ephesus is where there was a, a, a sculpture, a, an image, right? Idolatry of the goddess Diana that was, that was created, okay? This goddess Diana that was created in Ephesus was from a meteor that came down that they took this meteor that landed and hit in Ephesus and they ended up making this, this pagan sculpture of this goddess Diana. It happened because a meteor landed in Ephesus. We're talking about the revelation of a meteor coming during this eight-day, seven, eight-day period that we know is a picture during the time of Ephesus. You following? It's directly connected to a period of time related to Ephesus. And what does Ephesus represent as the apostles is represented as the first seven to the eight days while the wedding is taking place in heaven and the stone's throw has happened? Hello. So what are we going to see? What, what's involved in this first week? Stone's throw? A group being told to prepare? The pre-trib escape happening, him anointing the apostles, this stone's throw landing, causing chaos and devastation, him returning after the seven-day wedding on the eighth day, him gathering that Luke 24 group, that Smyrna group, for which they will follow him for 40 days after he gives them a meal and serves them. They will then follow him, see what he does, be his light, and receive his light to go and shine that light throughout the earth. This is all still just the beginning 
of the above period of time. I told you, we know a lot about this now. That's how incredibly detailed it is. If you ever need, you can always pause the video, rewind it, watch, go to the scriptures, read them again for yourself. All of this is this period of time right here that we've spoken about. That's it. But guess what? That's still not it. There's still more, right? Let me show you a little bit more in relation to that to that uh, Ephesus right here, okay? Right here. To Ephesus. In Acts chapter 19, look at what they did in Ephesus. They created this silver shrine called Diana, right? It looks like it has a bunch of breasts on it because she's for... Um, uh, uh, she was for the representation of, uh, 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 um, uh, you know, birth and, and having babies, you know, I, it slips my mind. So for having many children, right? And that's what she was the goddess of. And of course, it became worn and there was other things as well. But that's why she had all these breasts. And it was really because of also the way the meteor was designed. And they started worshiping her. See, got the great, uh, great is Diana of the Ephesians from Acts 28. And you can read about where she came from in verse 35. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and the image which fell down from Jupiter? Okay. It was a meteor that came down, and it was the Ephesians, it was Ephesus, it was during those eight days represented by the bride portion that we're talking about. Let me go back to the calendar. That we're talking about that is related to the apostles' portion. So we even have scripture telling us about it. Stones throw here, stones throw there, perfectly aligned with the timing in Luke for the wording, perfectly aligned in John chapter 8, where it is right there in Ephesus, the first church, which represents the apostles during the seven days from the beginning of 50, even though, yes, they will remain, but they will have that power and go out during the time of seals. They're, they're the ones who will lay the foundation. There is going to be a spiritual foundation being laid during the time of seals, and it is the apostles' responsibility to do it, while at the same time, we know that during seals, there's going to be a physical foundation being laid as well, so that when trumpets begins, the temple can start. Incredible stuff, okay? What else do we know about Ephesus? Check this out. You want to see how crazy this is? Look at the understanding that we have in these things where the Spirit has led us. It's, it's over the top. Um, where was it? I know I've opened it. Let me see. Let me see. Do I have it back there? No, I think I even have it further up here. Um, oh, why does it slip my mind? I know where it is. I know where it is. Um, oh, yes, got it. Thank you, Lord. We know this also in Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 11. Listen to this. Go forth, O you daughters of Zion, and behold King Solomon with the crown wherewith his mother crowned him in the day of his espousals. Hello where he was crowned in the day of his espousals. For those that don't know, this that is in the book, the Ministry Revealed book, which you can download for free on Ministry Revealed in five languages. You can listen it in English, in audio for free. You can read it from the website or you can get it from Amazon if you like a paperback. Here's the story of the seven churches. We've got a video that breaks it down. The revealed revelation of the end time seven churches. Remember, Ephesus starts the 50 days. This is on the eighth day, right? Well, check it out. I didn't put this together, just so you know. This was from other scholars who had done a study and put together the typology of the Old Testament 
and the New Testament typologies within the churches. And when I saw this, I understood immediately it came to me the revelation that has been a mystery since they came to be revealed or understood or written is the revelation of them in the end of days. I've said many times the things that played out over thousands of years are going to play out over 14 years. And it starts with what? 50 days beginning. Look at this. How does the apostolic age, the time of Ephesus, the apostolic age, the beginning of the 50 days start after the pre-trib is gone? While the wedding is there, the apostles have been anointed. Look at what it says. The day of Israel's espousals. I never made this, guys. Look at what it says here. When King Solomon with, with when, uh, behold, King Solomon with a crown, wherewith his mother crowned him in the day of his espousals. And it just so happens, it's the start of Ephesus, which is the beginning of the 50 days. You following how amazing this is? It's over the top incredible. And you're going to see, <coughs> excuse me, how that continues to tie in as we go in further to this 40 days of the Son of Man. See, but you think, oh, this has got to be it. No, what about this? What about Psalms 18? What about the craziness of what's going to happen during those first seven days after the escape you have to consider guys there's so much stuff at play tens of millions of people vanished they all have the spirit of the living god in them and poof they're gone there's only a remnant left imagine that energy imagine that power gone and then the stones throw coming What's going to happen? Look at what it says in, in Psalms 18 without going through all of it, right? The earth shook and trembled. The hills, uh, uh, the foundations moved. Uh, the hills were moved, were shaken, for the Lord was wroth. He did ride upon a cherub. He did fly um, upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion was round about him, were dark skies and thick clouds, or were dark waters and thick clouds of skies. Uh, verse 15. The channels of waters were seen and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of thy nostrils. Why? Earthquakes and volcanic eruption. All of this is directly related to what's going to be taking place during those seven days. Does it mean the entire world is going to be laid in disaster? No. It means there's going to be areas of the world laid in crazy disaster pockets and portions of it and things breaking out all over the place it's not going to be in one area but it's going to be all over the world right at the time after the escape <coughs> of tens of millions of people has happened all of this is still the beginning but what else do we know it's still not the end Right? We, we know that it's still just the opening scene. Right? Here, here's what else we get. Something we've covered in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15. Right? Jesus rose the third day. He met with the 12. After that, he met with a larger number. After that, he was seen of the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me as one born out of due time. You see? So what did he do? He met with Matthew's group. He met with the Mark group. He met with John's group. And he met with Luke's group. This Luke group is not per se the remnant workers. Remember, he is going to meet with the remnant workers first briefly, right? <clears throat> this is the relation of those born out of due time, which is the pre-trib escape. So what do you got? What do you have? You have Luke, John, Mark, Matthew. He met with all of these different groups, but we've all been told it was just the 12, just the 12, just the 11. He met with all of these different groups. That's how many different portions of people were following him, and they were all related to the Gospels. Crazy, not craziness, right? Well, this one born out of due time 
we all know this one born out of due time and how this all correlates. So let's walk through what ends up happening. Well, in part of it, we actually already did, right? Because we have the body was gone. This right here, this body gone is, like I said, the pre-trip escape of the bride of Christ. So after the pre-trib happens, what do we know happens? After the pre-trib group and the stones throw, we know that it's going to be John chapter 20. Right? Because it goes from the pre-trib. So he meets with the, the Luke remnant worker to let them know. But then the escape happens. After that pre-trib is one born out of due time, then he meets with the, with the apostles. That's the Luke chapter 20. Then he meets with the disciples again on the eighth day. <clears throat> right? He goes to the, the apostles first, and then he comes to meet with the disciples. When he comes to meet with the disciples on that same eighth day, when he comes on the eighth day, he's with them and they follow him for how long? He's here with them for 40 days. So this means that the Son of Man is going to be here for 40 days. And he speaks to them of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. We know he's going to warn as Jonah did. And he tells them that they're going to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Which means when the Son of Man comes after the wedding, okay, wedding, he returns on the eighth day. He's here for 40 days, which will be to somewhere around here. Then he's gone. And he said, not many days from now, one, two, three days. Seven days, 40 days, three days is the revelation of the above, which is the 50 days. What happens during these three days? The Son of Man is now gone. The Son of Man has left. And the raven antichrist spirit or the raven Ishmael spirit is now released. And a compassing about is going to take place. Okay? But the son of man is going to be here for 40 days. And I'm going to show you that as well. <clears throat> but what do we know from... Actually, let's go back over here. What do we know then from... Acts chapter 1, he was here then for 40 days after the seven, right? Wedding, 40 days. They're following him for 40 days. Then he's gone, and he tells the, they're told not many days hence. Where are they to go? Not many days is the three days until what? Until true Pentecost, which is the 50th day, and they'll be filled with the Holy Ghost at the time of new wine what have we shown we've been showing a lot lately that this is the period of time when the two wave loaves are brought into the church it's been observed and celebrated for hundreds of years and this is the period of time for over 600 years where they've been celebrating and observing new wine in the biggest festival of wine on earth for over 600 years okay that's because this to the lord god is true Pentecost, after the true count of the Feast of Weeks that began at the Lord's God, Lord God's in the beginning, Taurus, 16th day, the beginning of Genesis. It was in Taurus. That is the revelation of this. Okay? So, we, we've understood these things. <clears throat> we could track them through Scripture. We could track them through the Gospels. We can go chapter after chapter after chapter, breaking it all down. And we can show even more. Watch this. Let's go to Luke chapter 17. This is how detailed this opening portion called above is. In Luke chapter 17, he tells them in verse 24. You guys all know it, right? Um, For as lightning lighteth on one end unto the other, so shall it be in his day. Okay, this is when he returns at the end of trumpets. This is what it talks about in Matthew chapter 24 when he comes as lightning from one end unto the other. What does he say? But first. But 
first. So before all of this, before I even get to the end, it's going to start with, but first, must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of man, of the son of man. They did eat and drink. They married wives and were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Okay. What's the storyline? You guys all know it. The storyline is the 40 days of the son of man that is called but first. And look at what it says. Look at what it says. There's yet seven days. Verse 10 says, then it came to pass after seven days. And what happened after seven days? Go to verse 16, Genesis 7. And they that went in of male of all flesh as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth. You see? Seven days, after seven days, bang, 40 days of the flood. Sound familiar? Exactly. It's the story of the beginning of the 50 days. Okay? Now watch this. We go to uh, Genesis chapter 8. What happens at the end of 40 days? At the end of 40 days, you have the story of the window being opened, and look what's sent out. The raven. Who's the raven? You know, there was a video that was just shared in the forum by a guy that's got a really big channel. I think two or 300,000 some people, a Christian guy. And uh, I reached out to him by email and I posted a comment on his video. And he was very apologetic because he says, I, you know, I, I've come to understand. And he says, I don't see why everybody thinks it's a president. It's, it's the president of France. It's the president of the US. It's the president of Canada. It's this guy, that guy, who's gonna be the Antichrist. No, the Antichrist is going to be Arab. It is 100% going to be an Arab. All Christians have to do is, one, understand the Gospels, understand the revelation of the end of days better, and then take a little bit of time to look into Muslim prophecy. And when you look into the Muslim prophecies, you're going to see things that will blow your mind. That's why they're always against the Jews and against Christians. And then all of a sudden, what? It's going to be a Christian against all the Christians? No, it's going to be Arabs. It's, it, it's from Arabs, but they're going to be Muslim. They have a Mahdi and, quote unquote, a prophet. The prophet is going to be the false prophet, and the Mahdi is the Antichrist. It's not a mystery. It's so simple to understand, and you're going to be able to see better, especially if you're newer, in relation to this raven and the correlation to ishmael and the correlation to what's coming when the son of man is here so when the 40 days of the son of man come to an end the raven is sent out who is the raven from a dusky hue well what does the word mean arab why is it arab because of the texture the color of their skin the dark right the 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 darker color of their skin. The raven is the Arab. The raven uh, is the Ishmael. Ishmael is the Arab. So what do you see? Well, when the seven days are done, the 40 days start. When the 40 days are over, there's three days left. Who goes out first? The raven. We've shared on it. We'll, we'll break this down, but the raven is going to be Syria coming to attack. When those three days are over, <clears throat> before he attacks, okay? He's going to be compassing about, but he's not going to attack right away until after the dove comes and anoints, like Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, anoints them on the 50th day, that remnant worker bride, okay? When that happens, the dove is gone and the raven who was compassing them about, the Arab, the Muslim who was compassing them about, will attack and destroy Jerusalem. And that will begin the seven days as years of tribulation. Look at this. Seven days and then yet seven other days. Pretty crazy, right? Look at this. Stayed yet seven other days. Stayed yet seven other days. Look at this in Genesis 8.10. It's not the word stayed. It's the word for tribulation. 
pain, sorrow, travail. Right? Not even travail. Pain, sorrow, wound. Right? Wreathing in pain. Look at this one for stayed. Huh. Exactly what you would think to stay and wait seven more days. It just means to wait and be patient. Yet the one that's the 14 years that begins it is telling you tribulation. What happens? Look at this. Seven days as years. And then what? The dove goes out again and then brings in a group plucked off. Who are those plucked in the seventh year of tribulation of seals? The rapture group. The great multitude that are plucked off. Right? The ones that are harpazo that will be plucked off. And then what? Stayed yet seven other days, then never returned. It's the final two sevens of days as years, the 14 years. And how did it start? 40 days of the Son of Man. In the typology, the 40 days come to an end, and the raven spirit goes out. That's the one that's going to compass Jerusalem. These guys are going to receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost on the 50th day, and they're going to be sent out from Jerusalem and they're going to be preaching and doing all that they do for the Lord as his servant. And they're going to start with the anointing in Jerusalem. And then they're going to go out immediately from Jerusalem. Why? Because Jerusalem is going to be destroyed that very day or that following few hours or within that following day. It's all over the place, man. It's so, <laughs> it's, it's crazy wild to see these things and to be able to break them down, guys. Because you see, there's something else that happens before this raven even. You see, the raven attack, which is the, the Syria, Assad coming, and those that will come about and destroy Jerusalem. Like I said, that's the beginning of the 14 years of tribulation. That is the red rider sword being given, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. But there's still more that happens. Could you believe it? Especially if you're new. So we just took it down to here, and this is where the attack happens. This is the anointing of the Holy Ghost of Acts chapter 2. But when the Son of Man is gone, then the sword is given. And when the sword is given, so what ends up happening? A compassing about of Jerusalem takes place. And when the anointing takes place of the Holy Ghost, that true Pentecost, they will go out from Jerusalem immediately. And the following day, the raven will attack and destroy Jerusalem. But again, this is still getting maybe a little bit ahead of myself. Because there's still stuff that's going to take place at the beginning. Are you kidding me? There's still stuff that's about to take place in the beginning. You guys all know it very well. It's something that I share regularly and I love to share it because it is the epitome of the revelation that we've revealed here over the years that came to be understood earlier this year that was the icing on the cake. You see, in Isaiah chapter 9-1, this is the beginning of the 50 days. This is the beginning of the 50 days in Isaiah 9-1. This is the beginning of the 50 days. Just like at the escape. It's no different. Okay, This group is going to be told. Then the escape is going to happen. And the 50 days are going to start. The apostles are going to be anointed. And bam! In the midst of a stone's throw coming. In, in the midst of earthquakes and this stuff breaking out. In the midst of a wedding taking place in heaven. In the midst of the, the apostles going out. In the midst of the disciples waiting and being girded about for when the Lord returns on the eighth day. In the midst of all of this. Northern Israel is going to be attacked on the ninth of Av. Yes, you have heard it here. You've heard it before. It is what is called... The light affliction. Okay? In Isaiah 9 1. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. That is the light affliction. And afterward did more grievously 
afflict her. This light affliction of the Neftali of and Zebulun is what we have been revealing is the beginning of the 50th day, uh, the 50 days, the start of it, on the 9th of Av attack. This is going to be the short-lived Middle East attack that takes place in northern Israel, I believe is going to destroy Hel uh, Tel Aviv and Haifa, as well as some neighboring uh, 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 Arab nations as well. Not Syria. Not Syria. Damascus will not yet be destroyed. But Iran, Iraq, probably, okay? Iran, Iraq, probably in there, major destruction as well. That all begins here. It's only going to last a few days. And what's going to happen? Well, we've shown that the Son of Man, whose birthday is right here, we were able to show the revelation from Matthew 4 that equaled right here the equivalent to two months later when John was finally in prison is the equivalent to when Jesus showed up in Isaiah 9 which is what happens next. You see, for unto us a child is born. This, this is the typology of the birth of Christ, but we know from Matthew 4, it wasn't exactly at his birth. It was about two months later when he was there at about, what, 29, 29 years old and about two months in. This is when he showed up, about two months after he was baptized. Okay? And so... What do we see about him coming? In verse 2, it says, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. You see? They that dwell in the land of shadow of death, upon them the light hath shined. Doesn't that sound familiar? In John chapter 8, we saw this typology of, of the Gentile bride, the stone's throw. And then what do you get? John 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You see, because when the Son of Man is coming for 40 days, he is coming to shine his light and to give it to those disciples. This is that period of time. And that's why when we come back in Isaiah 9, look what happens. When that period represented as the 40 days of the Son of Man is done? Verse 12. The Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. Hello. They think things are going to be settled. The Son of Man here is going to be here. He's going to be declaring things. The world is going to be rejecting him, remember? Luke 17, he's going to be rejected. Because nobody on earth is aware that the Son of Man is coming for 40 days. Nobody is aware of it. They've all been told, because they learned from Matthew, they've all been told nothing happens until he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. So the only people that are going to be following him and knowing him are the remnant worker bride and some that will come to accept along the way. But it won't be millions and millions of people. He's going to be here warning Jerusalem warning them he's going to be warning the world he'll be doing signs and wonders and people are going to be thinking he's the antichrist because the muslims are going to be saying he's the antichrist you see what ends up happening you'll remember he's also going to be as jonah was when you understand the differences in the gospels you understand why the story of Jonah is so different in Luke, Mark, and Matthew. It's because one deals with pre, one deals with mid, one deals with post. So when Jesus here in Luke 11, and starting in 29, you know, uh, about halfway through, it says, they seek a sign and no sign shall be given it, but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. This is the final generation Jesus as Jonah was warning to the Ninevites. Jesus will be the one warning during the 40 days. You see? And look what you get. The queen of the south that shall rise up 
in the judgment with the men of this generation. Who are those men? You got it. The remnant bride workers. Who is the queen of the south? Well, that can bring us back also to Revelation chapter 12. There's, there's a number of things when you go to Revelation 12.1. You could say that, you know, the, the Revelation 12 sign of 2017 was to prepare people, but it was not. It 100% was not the sign that's coming. This has several meanings to it, but this word appeared means it's going to be something gazed at with eyes wide open as remarkable not something just simply voluntary observation, which also means not merely something mechanical being looked at. Revelation 12 sign, all we did was mechanically look at it with our programs online. That says it's not going to be something like that. It's not going to be something just voluntarily looked at. It's going to be something that's going to freak the bejesus out of everybody. They're going to be, what? panicking. What do you think that is? The stone's throw. The stone's throw. You see, I've always believed, I've mentioned it for a long time, that I believe the bride is going to escape between the end of verse 1 and the start of verse 2. So if that's the case, this is why I was saying earlier, the pre-trib, everybody might actually see this stone's throw, this great wonder that's coming. What's this great wonder related to? Diana. You see, there, there's an idol made of it, but it's a representation of, of Christ's mother, but it's also a future image of what? That time of the beginning of the 50 days time frame, when the stone's throw's coming, when, when the meteor's coming, it's connected to Ephesus. It's connected to the start of the, of the 50 days. You know what I heard, which was really interesting when somebody shared it with me? It was that um, on, I think it's July 25th. It was, I've never heard of this before. Um, there, and I'm gonna, I, I don't know what's called, conspiracy theory. I don't know what you want to call it. But they believe there's a group claiming that Princess Diana never really died and she's here as whatever it is and they showed a picture of her and just you know the world doesn't really believe it's her but these guys think it looks identical to her she's just old now and apparently on july 25th or the 26th i can't remember one of those two dates she's supposed to be giving a talk and i thought what you know i i'm, I'm not saying i believe that but i'm just saying what? Because look at that timing. Here we're talking about, you know, this, this stone's throw connected to Diana, the time of Ephesus, the beginning of the 50 days. And whoever this may be, if it's really her, I, I have no clue, is directly connected to this period of time. I just thought that was a very, very interesting side note. So let's keep going with this. So again, this is related to the stone's throw here. And listen to what it says now in verse 2. And she, being with child, cried travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. See, comma, and. There's two separate things happening here. So what do we see with travailing in birth? That can't be the pre-trib bride. The pre-trib bride has to already be gone before the travailing begins. And this is what I said to you in the beginning. When it all started with me years ago, it was because of this right here. I was in Luke 21, but I was also in this, in Revelation chapter 12, and Isaiah chapter 66, verse 7. Everybody used to point to this. There are, or I should say a number of people used to point to Isaiah 66, verse 7, as the pre-trib. And they're right. The problem is, then they turn around and they tell you, that the pre-trib is down here in Revelation chapter 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Well, the rod of iron is when he comes at the end of uh, seals on heavenly Mount Zion. It says, with the rod of iron and her child 
was caught up. You see that? Was caught up. This is the harpazo, great multitude. You see that word pluck, which was just like the, the end of the seven days as years, right? The representation in the seventh year of seals, the harpazo plucked. What is it? The was caught up. That's what brings us back to first uh, to Second Corinthians chapter 12. Not the first one, such as one, but the second one that says was caught up to paradise. This is the great multitude rapture going to paradise in the seventh year of seals. They're not the ones that are going to the third heaven. This is the part that's the greatest mystery for everybody to figure out. That's the pre-trib smaller group. That's why you'll, you'll, you, when you hear people talking about the rapture, they'll barely read this or they'll just read through it quickly. Why? Because this is the one that they point to, the was caught up. Because that was caught up is the was caught up of Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. So you can point to the was caught up and they say, see, this is the pre-trib rapture. No, it's not. It is the same place they think it is. But unfortunately, they've missed the fact that you can't be here if you're pre-trib. You can't be here while the travailing in birth is taking place. You cannot be here. That's what Isaiah 66, 7 is telling you. Because there's two taking place here. Before she travailed, she brought forth. What does that mean, before travail? One born out of due time. One born out of due time. That means before she travailed. Like Paul was telling us in 1 Corinthians 15. Before the travailing starts. She already brought forth. That's the pre-trib. So before the travailing, which means now before the travailing started, so before Revelation 12, 2, the bride is gone. And it means during the travailing, you see, because listen to what it says next. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a, of a man child. So what do you see? Before the travail, bang, somebody's gone before the travail. But then, before the pain, which means during the travailing, but before the pain, so that means this one that's being delivered is happening before, uh, during the travail. That's exactly what Revelation chapter 12, verse 2 is showing us. You see? And she, being with child, cried. Well, guess what? The pre-trib is already gone because... She's now crying, travailing in birth. So what is this travailing in birth? It's the 40 days of the Son of Man. Because remember, she then is travailing, and what does she do in the travailing part before the pain? Before the pain, but during the travailing, she brings forth a man-child. Hello. Do you understand it can't be the man-child down here? Because all of this is seals. This is the 40 days of the Son of Man. The bride is gone before the travailing, and the travailing is the 40 days of the Son of Man. And the word for pain, look at the word for travail, okay? Travail, experience pain, throes, sorrow, okay? This is all in relation to the, the 40 days of the Son of Man. Why isn't it scooping that? There we go. Okay? It's all the beginning. Now listen to this. And pain to be delivered. Look at that. To torture, pain, toil, torment, vex. What does all this mean? This is going to begin right here with the word pain is the beginning of the 14 years at the end of the 50 days. This word for pain is the first two and a half years approximately of the tribulation of seals starting at nation against nation once at the destruction of Jerusalem that starts the nation against nation at the end of the 50 days. This travailing in pain is the Son of Man's 40 days. Okay? What is this travailing in pain? This travailing in pain is, and this is something else that freaks people out, is the white horse rider. 
Let's read the White Horse Rider now, having remembered some of the other things that I shared. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him. Who had a crown that was given unto him? Didn't we read that there was one like Solomon, but a greater than Solomon is here? Isn't that what Luke's, uh, uh, um, Luke's Jonah story was? And one like Jonah, a greater, sorry, and, and one like Solomon, but a greater than Solomon is here. It's the son of man. So he's a picture as a typology of Solomon, who was given a crown by his mother on the day of his espousals. And the time of his espousals is at the beginning of the 50 days during that one week when he was receiving a crown from his mother. So who do you think? The white horse rider is who has a crown that was given to him and went forth conquering and to conquer. This is the son of man. And what causes a lot of people that, that come to start to understand this is there's people in both camps, right? Many people have thought and most people think it's the Antichrist. It 100% is not. And there are some that think it's it's the son of man. But they think it's him coming for the bride, you see? It's not that either. It's him coming for 40 days. He's already been married. He was already given his crown, you see? A crown was given unto him. It was given unto him during the time of his espousals. Hello. So one of the biggest issues as people come to understand this is they say, well, I thought it's the Son of Man who's opening the seals. Isn't it the Lord opening the seals? Yes, it is. Could he not open the seal and go as that with the white horse rider? Of course he can. Because the red horse rider, that red horse does not get open. That second seal isn't broken until after the Lord has returned. Let me show it to you in, in the picture here, okay? Here's where he starts his 40 days. His 40 days come to an end somewhere around here, and he's gone. And then there's what? Acts chapter 1. Not many days from now, they'll be endued by power from the Holy Ghost. So he's gone. What happens when he's gone? Remember what we said? When he's gone, the raven spirit goes out. The Arab is going to be empowered to now go out and what? Compass Jerusalem. Okay? So that red horse, that, that sword, is either being given after the Lord has returned to heaven and breaks the, red, the, the second seal, or it's he's now going to compass them about now that the Lord is gone, and as he compasses them about, Maybe the red, maybe the seal is broken here and the sword is given unto him right away. But it could be right after the Lord returns. He's now finished his 40 days, gone to heaven, and bang, the second seal opens. And it's at the second seal that the destruction ends up coming. It's the raven that gets it. So not only do we see it in the picture of the 40 days of the Son of Man in, in Acts, we also see it in the 40 days that he said his 40 days would be like in the final generation. When it says this generation, he means the final generation. It's, it's the same picture when we go to the story of Genesis and the story of the ark. His, the 40 days were over, then the window opened and bang, the raven was sent out. You see? So it's after the 40, the son of man is gone, the white horse rider is gone. Then, you see? And, and it's the same thing. We even get a picture of this in Luke chapter 19. In Luke chapter 19, at the end, uh, just before the end, when Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, this is something else you also only find in Luke's gospel. It's a picture of him coming to, at the start of the 40 days. Okay, It's at the triumphal entry, which is a picture of him coming also at his 40 days. And it says, 
and he was come near, starting in 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come, un, uh, uh, shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast the trench about thee, and compass thee around, and keep thee in on every side, and they shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children with thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. Okay? This is the coming compassing about that will be during those three days of the not many days from now. The anointing of the Holy Ghost will take place. The Holy Ghost leaves. They go out from Jerusalem and bang. You see, when you go into the story of the Gospels, the end portion, like we said, in the, um, in the, uh, um, uh, the, the work that they're to do into their uh, commission, you only find it in Luke's where they're told that it says in verse 47 and that, rep and that repentance and remission of sin sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Only these guys are told beginning at Jerusalem and only these guys are told to wait for the promise of the Father and wait in Jerusalem. Only these guys. Not Mark's group, not Matthew's group. Remember, I showed you in 1 Corinthians 15, they're separate groups. I showed you in Luke chapter 12. This is the first watch group. Mark's is the second watch. Matthew's is the third. There are three separate groups. So you can see the, the, it's, it's completely laid out and built in all throughout the Gospels. It is all prophetic, guys. And this is the time of the Arab, of the Ishmael that's coming, of the one that when these three days are over and the anointing of the Holy Ghost comes, they go out from Jerusalem and bam, Jerusalem is attacked. And it just so happens it's the beginning of the 14 years at the Jews' new year. Okay? So when the Son of Man is here during those 40 days, and now we've been able to show it in so many places, let me show you again, for those that haven't seen this, what the Jews, uh, uh, sorry, what the Arabs, or I should say the Muslims, know about this guy coming for 40 days. You see, the enemy has pre-told them. And I believe the reason the enemy pre-told them that somebody was coming for 40 days first is so that they wouldn't be swayed to go and follow him. By having been told in their Apocrypha books that prophetically somebody is coming for 40 days who is going to claim to be or who is going to not claim to be, but do things as Jesus did, he is going to be a false messiah. You see, he's going to be called the false Messiah. And because the remaining Christians or, or believers that are coming to believe have no idea that he's actually coming for 40 days first, they're going to reject him just like he said in Luke 17. And at the same time, you're going to have Muslims all over the world saying he's the Antichrist, Christians. He's the Antichrist that you guys were talking about, church. Don't believe him. What do you think they're going to do when he's gone after 40 days? I thought the Antichrist was here for like seven years or something. Why is he gone after 40 days? And then not too far down the road, guess who shows up? Antichrist and false prophet is really hard on the scene. Now, are they already going to be here? Yeah. Antichrist and them are already going to be here. We'll get to that in a moment. But they call this guy al Messi or Ad-Dajjal, okay? The Dajjal. It means deceitful messiah. They say, listen to this, like in Christianity, see that? They even try to pre-set you up. Like in Christianity, the Dajjal is said to emerge from the East through specific various location sources. The Dajjal will imitate miracles performed by Jesus, such as healing the sick, raising the dead, the latter one done by devils. Yeah, he's going to raise the dead by devils. Yeah, sure, that's how it's going to work, right? 
He will deceive many people, such as weavers, magicians, right? Children of fornication. So they think he is the Christian's antichrist. That's what they try to sell it to everybody as. And the Christians have no idea that the Son of Man is coming for 40 days after the wedding. They're going to think he's the Antichrist. That's why they're all going to reject him. Look at what it says. This is the Sunni Muslims. And it says that when the Dajjal appears, he will stay for 40 days. How about that? They've been prepared for it so that they don't come to believe him during that time. It's all true, guys. The Son of Man is coming for 40 days. <clears throat> he is the white horse rider. He is the Solomon type, as Jonah said, greater than Solomon, who's coming, having been crowned at his wedding during the time of his espousals. It's all true. His time is the time of the travailing, just as we saw from Isaiah chapter 66. The pre-trib is the are the ones before the travailing even began. This is why we show <clears throat> and explain this mystery of the rapture of this pre-trib group going. How many people have you heard tell you that the pre-trib happens in a place within here before the travailing. I don't know of anybody. Everybody points to the was caught up of Revelation 12, 5. And it's simply not possible. What they haven't realized is this is the 40 days of the Son of Man. <clears throat> this is the two and a half years of nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, World War III. And verse 3 is the beginning of the 42 months of the Antichrist, the beast, beginning period of time. Okay? Let me show you that. Okay? Let's see what happens in Luke. Let's go to Luke chapter 21. This is still part of the 50 days, and we're going to lead into that next part. Look what happens here. Okay? In Luke's discourse, we see black letter words in verse 10. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, great earthquakes, fearful sights, great signs. Verse 12. But before all these. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sound familiar? Absolutely does, doesn't it? It's Luke chapter 17. But first, but before all these. This means 40 days of the Son of Man before nation against nation it means but first white horse rider <clears throat> because nation against nation kingdom against kingdom is the red horse rider is when the sword is going to be given and we've covered many times if you go into ezekiel 21 you see ezekiel as a typology of the son of man who is to warn israel and judah that the sword is about to be furbished. The Lord Father has the sword. It's furbished. It's ready. He's going to give it to the destroyer. He's coming. It's furbished. That's what the Son of Man is doing. He's here to warn for 40 days to wake people up. The disciple worker group is going to be with them, following them. The apostles are already going to be out preaching as the Lord would with power and authority. This but before is only found in Luke's discourse. And what does it say? Right from the beginning of the 40 days. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering up in the synagogues and to prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts uh, to not meditate what you shall answer, okay? So when, if and when you're taken as a worker into prison and captive and so forth, don't think about what you're going to try to say to them because the Holy Spirit is going to give you the words. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. Do you understand when this is going to start, guys? Just so you have an idea, 
This is the escape. There's the wedding. There's the 40 days starting. So after you've been anointed, you've been with the Lord, not anointed, but after you've been with the Lord, he's opened your understanding. He's had a meal with you and served you. Persecution is about to begin. Okay. Then it says, and you shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends. And some of you, they shall cause to be put to death. For those that don't know who the some of you are, those some of you that they shall cause to be put to death, you got it. They are Smyrna. Okay, verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. For the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. And you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life. You see, the crown comes at the end of tribulation. When people will get their crowns. And remember, those that died during this period. His remnant worker group, they're part of the second, right? They're part of the resurrection on who the second death will have no hurt, okay? Some of you, that is the Smyrna group. That's what we keep showing. It's, it's the Luke 21 group, right? Luke 21, Luke 24 group, Smyrna. The Priscilla's and Aquila's, we call them. And this, so the, these are all things still only happening during the 40 days, okay? Um, it says in Luke 17, uh, 21, 17, and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not a hair of your head perish in your patience, possess you, your souls. Uh, now listen to this. Here it comes. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation is near. Let them which be in, which are in Judea flee to the mountains. And let them which are in the midst depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. You see, compassing about is now happening. See, this compassing about doesn't happen during the 40. He's warning about it during the 40. And when he's gone, he's saying, while he's here, you're going to see this coming. And when I'm gone, bang, there it is. Now it's happening. So he's warning that it's coming. But it doesn't happen while he's here. It's not until the raven spirit goes out, that air spirit goes out. So we know at the end of his 40 days, this compassing about is going to take place. And those who were being warned should know. And us who would still be there right during the three days, waiting for that anointing, people would be warning, flee, get out. Okay, they're going to see it themselves, them being compassed about. And it says in verse 23, But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Remember, he was warning them like Luke 19 as well. Same thing. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and they shall be led away captive into all nations. You see, guys? For those, when we were talking about the 70 years and Jeremiah 25 and how it has to be the end of 70 of Israel because the 70 ending of Jerusalem 14 years later is the great wine press, clearly not the beginning of tribulation, but the end of tribulation. Yet this end of 70, here's your answer. Okay, and they shall be led away of the sword. They shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That's called seals. You see, the Jews are going to be removed from the land for the seven years of seals until the times of the Gentiles are done. And what's going to happen at the attack of Jerusalem? They're going to be destroyed, removed, taken captive, scattered everywhere, and bang, World War III will start. And that will be the official beginning of the 14 years of tribulation at the red horse rider when Jerusalem is destroyed. You see, it's all here, guys. That's why we have the sum of you, the but before all these. This is the red horse rider at nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That's why you can go to Mark's discourse and you see Mark's discourse because it goes Luke, Mark, Matthew. Look at how Mark's discourse starts. Okay, in verse eight. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. 
Not then he said unto them. There's no but first. There's no before these things. It's nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Does that mean the 50 days that came prior wasn't already quote unquote tribulation? Well, of course it was, right? Of course it was tribulation. But it's not quote unquote the beginning of the 14 years. It's that's why I started with 2 Corinthians 5, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's this portion called above. It's it's this 50 day period. It's the attack of the fifth and the seventh month. It's it's the it's the revelation of of the story of the ark. <laughs> it's it's the it's the last chapter of the Gospels at the resurrection portion and and the count going into Acts. It's everywhere it's it's isaiah chapter 9 it is all over the place you see nation against nation kingdom against kingdom and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places there shall be famines and troubles these are the beginnings of sorrows the beginnings <clears throat> so from the destruction on jerusalem world war three breaking out all of this. So see, some are going to be coming to Christ, of course, right? And it says, uh, da, 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 verse 9, but take heed to yourselves as they deliver up synagogues being beaten, right? Brought before kings. <clears throat> and the gospel must first be published among all nations. Uh, take no heed beforehand. The Holy Ghost will speak for you. Now brother shall betray brother. You see, we know that the betrayal of brother against brother is what happens during seals. Because what happens at the end of seals is the typology of John when he will restore, you see, he's going to restore mother to father, uh, 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 mother to daughter, son to father, and so on and so forth. It's at the end of seals, at the end of the sixth year of seals, <clears throat> that this restoration will have taken place so that they could be together and renewed in time of the rapture takes place. This is why when you go to Matthew's discourse, you don't have this. There's no longer brother against mother, father against son. Okay? There's only, and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. You know what's interesting in this? In this portion right here, that we explain before the abomination of desolation happens. This portion right here of Mark chapter 13, verse 8, to verse 13 is the word in Revelation chapter 12, verse 2, called pain. Crazy, right? That's impossible, isn't it? What do you think nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom is? <clears throat> what do you think the torture and pain and toil and vexed and torment, what do you think all of this is? It's the first about two and a half years of tribulation. It's the portion that is World War III, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. But while this nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom is taking place, you have apostles throughout the world laying the foundation for the kingdom, the spiritual foundation. You have the disciples by the 24,000, some of them dying right off the start in the 40 days, but <clears throat> you have them waking up people, preaching and teaching the revelation and repentance. There are people that are going to be coming to the Lord in the midst of World War III like crazy. It is going to be the absolute greatest revival in human history. And it's not going to begin at nation against nation. It's probably going to begin slowly, but it's going to start at the time of the pre-trib escape. That's why the apostles are going to have that anointing right off the bat. They're going to keep the sins against whoever has them, and they're going to remit the sins against those they, they judge they to remit them to. <clears throat> so there's going to be a lot taking place right off the bat. But those first two and a half years of seals during World, World War III is purposed out of the Lord God's love to bring in the greatest multitude, 
the greatest revival combined in all of human history ever seen. But it's going to come in during much pain. During much pain. What is this portion of pain? We saw that it was earthquakes, right? We saw that it was troubles in Mark, which means roilings of water. We saw that there was famines. Okay. What do you think is going to happen? Well, look at what it says about the red horse rider. Okay. Second seal is open. Revelation 6 verse 4. And there went out another horse that was red and power was given to him that sat on it to take peace from the earth that they should kill one another. That's called neighbor against neighbor, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, city against city. And there was given unto him a great sword. All you have to do is go read, uh, uh, um, like I said, go read uh, Ezekiel chapter 21. Okay? This is the beginning of the attack on Jerusalem and World War III breaking out all over the earth. That is the great sword given. What's going to happen during that time? During World War III, you see, because all of these aren't necessarily going to be one one year and then one another year and then one another year. That's not how it's going to be. But by the end of the sixth seal, it'll be the end of the first six years of tribulation. It doesn't mean it's one by year, one by year. Because you see that the white horse rider is going to be here for about 40 days. Then the red horse rider opens. When the red horse rider starts, I don't think you're waiting, you know, a year or even six months and so forth for the third and for the fourth necessarily. You see, we know that some will overlap. One will end. The next one will start. The next one will open and overlap the other one. And the other one will overlap when another one ends and then another one comes. So there, there's this combination of things and how it plays out. We know that the, this sword is going to be going for a while. We know that for at least two and a half years is World War III. But it doesn't mean all fighting against neighbors and everybody is going to suddenly stop. It might get diminished, <clears throat> but it's not going to stop. Look at what happens. You can tell that the third uh, seal is also part of the first two and a half years because it's about famine, right? It says, and the third seal was open. I heard him that sat on him beheld, lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice saying in the midst of the four beasts, say, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, uh, and see thou hurt not the oil or the wine. Okay, famine, scarcity. That was what it said in the first portion of Mark's discourse. It included earthquakes and famine and troubles, which is roiling waters. Okay? It's all part. The red horse rider and the black horse rider, at least those two, are part of the first two and a half years. What about the fourth? There might be a good chance the fourth is as well. Let's see what it says. Uh, the fourth beast, verse 8, I looked and lo, a pale horse. Uh, and he that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given him over the fourth part of the earth. Okay? Either a, a fourth portion. You know what was interesting? There was a video shared in the forum uh, about a month or two ago. And it was this great, great uh, revelation. I'd never heard of it before. That in history, when the Americas were discovered, they called the Americas the fourth portion of the earth. It's pretty wild. I, I was going to share it and I totally forgot about it. Um, but it's called the fourth part of the earth in literature from like 100, 200 some years ago. It was really quite wild. So the, red, uh, the, the pale horse could very well be North America, right? The Americas. Pretty crazy, right? <clears throat> so there was a lot more to it. But there was, he showed writings on it, these ancient books or very old books on it and um, what it was called and why they called it it and, and all sorts of things. So America in the Bible, pale horse rider and death and hell followed him and power was given him over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. 
You see, this also sounds like it could still be the 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 first two and a half years, but it also sounds like it might even be the time of Antichrist showing up. All right, a fourth part of the Earth to kill. Well, what's going to kill the fourth part? What would kill North America? Something's coming with the sword, even though there was nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And now you got hunger again. There's more death and beasts of the earth are also killing. That's pretty crazy stuff, right? Well, we have to understand at some point during this period of time of seals, we know the Antichrist is coming. Right? Let me show you. In Mark chapter 13, some might say, well, doesn't the Antichrist come right off the bat? I mean, was that a picture of the Antichrist in the raven that goes out, right? When Syria comes and attacks. It might be the spirit of Antichrist, and Antichrist might actually be there at that point, but he's not, and in fact he is, <clears throat> right from the beginning of tribulation, as that raven spirit. But what we don't what we do see also is that he's not given power and authority as the superpower, as the leader of it all, until about two and a half years into seals. And we see it right here in Mark 13, okay? In Mark 13, we saw the nation against nation, troubles, right? Famines, all this is the beginning of sorrows. All that is the two and a half years. You're going to be persecuted for those that are coming to believe, brothers betrayed. And then what happens? The abomination of desolation. You did not see antichrists or false prophets mentioned in this first part. Look what happens at the abomination of desolation. This abomination of desolation in Mark, what most people don't realize is that there are two abominations of desolations. We've shared on it many times. We've got videos on it. The abomination of desolation in Mark is the Mark of the Beast one, okay? Standing where it ought not. It's different than Matthew's. And you saw in Luke, he didn't even have one. You see, to stand where it ought not, to, to be placed, okay? To place where it ought not. So it, it's being put somewhere where it shouldn't. Well, what do we know the time of seals are? When Jerusalem is scattered and they're spread out throughout the world now and the land is going to rest, what on earth is happening to the world? Well, Luke told us until the time of the Gentiles is over. The time of the Gentiles isn't until the time of the end of seals, right? The world, the house of Israel, the Gentiles grafted in. It's going, excuse me, until the end of seals. And what is happening still during seals? It's still, quote unquote, the church age until the end of seals, which means the spirit of God is still dwelling in, uh, in, in the people that are coming to Christ. There's no temple built yet. The people are still the temple. This is the time of the mark of the beast. Okay? This is the time of the mark of the beast. And look at what it says. You follow it down. Okay? Now it's talking about woe that time. Woe to the children and those that give suck in those days. You see, people that don't understand the discourses properly somehow try to skew this to say all the children are gone pre-trib. It's 100% not true. You saw them in Luke's discourse when Jerusalem is about to be compassed and destroyed. You, you look throughout all of history, not all the children were removed first. You see it in all discourses, the children, some children are still there. You see, and then it says in verse 19, <clears throat> for in those days, shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of creation. Why now, after World War III and about two and a half years of seals, is it suddenly now going to be worse than it's ever been? Because now it's the mark of the beast time, because who's here? False prophets and false prophets, false Christs and false prophets shall arise. Okay? There's a plural because there will probably be, be many, right? But it's specifically pointing to the false Christ, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Isn't that interesting? 
that it's at the time of the abomination of desolation when now it's going to be worse than it ever was in human history? That all of this stuff that came first of nation against nation and famine and animals and destruction and, and some Christians even being killed and people being delivered up along the way was only the beginning, the first two and a half years. That's why it said, these are the beginnings of sorrows. Isn't that terrifying? World War III, literal global World War III. Famines, troubles, earthquakes, devastation everywhere. Right? All the supply lines, all the fuel, all, all the, the probably debit machines, your, your money, food. This is why we here in this ministry have at least, I know I have, and I know many in the ministry have prepared some food supplies and water. Because we expect to use it? No. Because we pray and prepare for others that we know will come. And what do we put in it? We put Bibles in those, in those food items. We put in the cat, in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, holders, the, the, the boxes of food and where water is. We put Bibles. We put information, left behind letters, clips, uh, uh, USB drives for videos they could stick into their phone. I've even got little attachments so they could put it in their phone and watch the USB clip. Okay? This is why we do those things. Because this is what just the beginning is going to be. Okay? So what does it mean at the time of the abomination of desolation? Now you've got antichrist and false prophets showing up. Well, isn't it interesting when we go back now to Revelation chapter 12, look what happens after the word pained, which we explained, which I explained was the first two and a half years of seals. Look what verse three says. And there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold, a great red dragon having seven horns and ten, uh, seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Look at that. There appeared a great red dragon. But what was it? It was another wonder in heaven. He's not cast down to the earth. There's, there's something again that's going to be seen in heaven at about two and a half years into seals. Well, isn't that interesting? Because when you go to Revelation chapter 13, look at what you see. Revelation 13, verse 1. And I sat upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horn ten crowns, and upon his head the words of the name of blasphemy. Listen to this. Verse 3. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, listen to this, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Hello. Who gave him his power and his great authority? The dragon did. The dragon gave him his great power, seat, and authority. When does the dragon show up? When did the dragon get seen? After the pained portion, which is directly correlated to about two and a half years at the end, as World War III, yes, there's still going to be wars, but World War III is coming to an end. Why is World War III coming to an end? Because the dragon is about to give authority to the beast. What happened during those first two and a half years is given to us in Daniel chapter 7. Remember we said, it starts with the lion who comes from the north. Daniel 7, verse 4. The lion, right? The first was the lion. Okay? What was the second? A bear. What was the third? A leopard. What did the beast have in Revelation 13? He now had the power of the leopard, the bear, and the lion. Who is the lion? Let me help you guys sort that out. The lion we showed you is Syria who comes first. That's what it said, first. And look at what we see. Disaster from the north. Hello. Who's the disaster from the north? 
Jeremiah 4, verse 5. Declare ye in Judah and publish in Jerusalem and say, blow the trumpet in the land. Cry, gather together and say, assemble yourselves and go and let us go into the defense cities. Set up a standard towards Zion. Retire, stay not. For I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. The lion is come up from his thicket and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. Who is coming to destroy Jerusalem? The lion from where? From the north. Who is the lion from the north who is coming? It is Syria. It is Syria. You see, let me show you in Genesis. What is this connection with Syria, with, with the Arab, with the raven? It's the Ishmael character. It is Ishmael, okay? The first one born to Abraham. He's a wild man. Everybody against him and him, and against, every, him against everybody. Abraham was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. Look what happens in chapter 17 of Genesis. Abraham is now 99 years old and Ishmael is 13 years old. What happens in the 13th year? The Lord makes a covenant with Abraham and his household. You're going to see at the end what happens at the end of 13 years. The Lord renews his covenant that he had made at the start of trumpets. He renews it at the end of the 13th year. And what happens in the 14th year? We all know the typology. Here it is. Isaac is born and Abraham was 100 years old. This story is 14 years. What was it? 13 years and one. You remember how we started with some of this? 13 years and then one. 13 years. So there's the promise of marriage. Then they, they have the marriage. Then there's the one year preparation. And at the end of the 14th year of that one year, at the, which is the end of the 14th, bang, the final wedding takes place. It's the same story. It's seven and seven. Six, one, six, one. This is the promised Lord coming, and that is the picture. But what did we see at the start of the 13? And at the end of the 13, you had Ishmael there. Ishmael is a type of what? It is the Arab line, right? Just so happens it's the Arab Ishmael line. Well, all we got to do to see who that is, is go into Jeremiah, and in that, we're going to understand the attack that happens right here by Syria, the destruction coming from the north, which is all throughout Scripture, which told us the typology of the raven being Arab and the connection to the destruction coming at the end of the year, at the year's end, at that turn of the year, which is right here. And what happens? He destroys them, right? He removes them from the land. Look what happened. Here it is right here. Seventh month, Ishmael also slew all the Jews that were there with him, even Gedaliah. You see, the third of Tishri is the fast of Gedaliah, but the actual attack was the first of Tishri. Who is the one that destroyed Gedaliah? This is the attack, see, that starts on the ninth of Av. Okay, that's the first attack. And then 50 days later is, or after that 50th day, is the second attack. It's Isaiah 9 and the Son of Man in between. Who's the picture? Who's the image? Ishmael. Ishmael brings that first attack. It is the picture of Syria. We saw that what? The picture of Ishmael was the, the first one for Abraham. The beginning of 13 years, at the end of 13 years, Ishmael is there again. And then the promise of the son returning. Well, guess what? We also see that exact same picture in 2 Chronicles chapter 24. Watch this. Verse 23. And it came to pass at the end of the year that the host of Syria, see, came up against them. And they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the princes of the people and came from among the people and sent all the spoil unto them to the king of Damascus. You see, 
Damascus isn't destroyed at the beginning, not till later in trumpets. For the army of the Syrians came with a small company of men. And the Lord delivered a very great host into their hand because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. This is the destruction of the Jews that removes them from the land at the year's end this year, 2023, at the Ishmael point of the beginning of 13 years. So what about at the end of 13 years to represent Ishmael and Syria coming at the end of 13 years? For that, all we have to do is go into 1 Kings chapter 20. And this one's awesome to be able to prove out, okay? 1 Kings chapter 20. At the return of the year, the king of Syria is coming, right? Here comes the king of Syria at the return of the year to fight against Israel. And they were there. So now, now Syria has a large group, a large number of fighters. But Israel, right? They're, they're a smaller group. They're like two little flocks before the Syrians. And the Syrians get boastful, okay? And he says that the Lord, that... Uh, the Lord is God, so their Lord, right, is the Lord God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude in thine hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So what happens here? Now the Syrians are going to lose. But Alan, how do you know that this is the, the Ishmael typology of Syria at the start of 13 and at the end of 13? Well, we can see the first one. Because we know that's the attack that happens that removes them from the land. But how do we know this one is 13 years later? Right here. So, uh, 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 15. Halfway through. And after them, he numbered all the people and all the children of Israel, being 7,000. When we go into Romans chapter 11, verse 4, we see there's a prophetic word here. That the Lord, see, he's talking again. You see Elias there, right? Elijah there. So it's the prophetic future. And it says in verse 3, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Verse 4 says, But what saith the, uh, but what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved. Okay, look at this. I have left behind, I have reserved, I have left behind to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed down, uh, who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Okay, what does that have to do? There's a 7,000 there from Israel, there's a 7,000 there being reserved unto the end. Well, if you want to see the answer, what is the end of the sixth trumpet okay what is the end of the sixth trumpet it's the end of what the 13th year of tribulation so you had an ishmael syria right here and you have an ishmael syria right here well that didn't yet show it that just said that he had he had seven thousand reserved for the end okay well let's go see what the end of the sixth seal says Verse 13 and 14, uh, Revelation 11, verse 13 and 14. And the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. What's that? That's the end of the sixth trumpet, the end of the sixth year of tribulation of trumpets, the end of the 13th year of tribulation what's the direct connection right what we saw in isaiah uh, in first kings chapter 20 there were seven thousand for israel followed by syria coming and a great destruction what was it with ishmael the beginning of 13 years the end of 13 years 14th year there's the promise of isaac guys this is awesome it's so so exciting breaking this all down, right? We can see this now. We can understand that. We saw that with Ishmael. We saw that even to Jeremiah. Okay. Now, what is that in correlation? What is this end of the 13th year here? 
Well, we just saw in, um, in, uh, uh, um, excuse me, in, where is it? Genesis chapter 17, that when the 13 years had passed from when he was 86 till he was, what, uh, 99, and Ishmael was now 13, that he made a covenant with him, right? So we saw that then the Lord made a covenant with him and his family. So what's another picture of this? Well, we showed it with um, with uh, 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 um, Jacob, right? And his two wives and working for the cattle. Well, look at what else we see. Okay, we see a bigger picture. In Genesis 31, 41, it says, Thus have I been 20 years in thy house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for thy cattle. What was this picture? This was the seven years that he served, and then he got Leah, who is a picture of the Gentile bride, who is the first fruits of the wheat, who is the who represents uh, um, the one he didn't really want, right? The Gentile one. It represents um, the the winter wheat, okay? And then what did he do after the wedding? He ends up getting Rachel for who he has to still serve seven more years. This is the 14 years that that story is talking about, the seven easy and then the seven years of seals. And then what did he say? Then I worked six more years for you for the cattle. That's the six years of trumpets. So when he's completed 20 years, this is the picture of the 20 years that he's talking about. What happened at the end of those 20 years? At the end of the 20 years, he made a covenant. Well, how about that, right? Same thing here. Here's another way of looking at it. And what is it? Bang, 20 years. That 20 years equals the end of 13 years. What was it with Ishmael and Abraham? 13 years. What was it with Jacob and his two wives and with the cattle, with his father-in-law? It was 20 years. Hello. This is when he makes the covenant. When he makes that covenant, look what else we can find. This is what mixes up a lot of people because it all goes back to who the Gospels are speaking to and to the revelation of the end time years. But you must understand who the Gospels are speaking to first. Look at this, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So you look at the 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem, there's the 70th year of Jerusalem. Starting with the destruction, and then when he returns, there's a destruction because of an attack coming, right? Ze Zechariah chapter 14. It's, it's all there. But listen to what it says. This is why so many people get mixed up in this, okay? Daniel 9, 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. Hello. That means Jerusalem had to be attacked. Unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, comma, end. These seven weeks are the seven years of seals, the, 70, uh, the seven feasts of weeks that will take place during the first seven years. Okay, this is what's happening. Comma, end. Three years. Three scores, so 60 counts of weeks, which is about a year and two months, and two weeks, which is two more years. So I believe that that count, the literal prophetic end count of this is seven years and another three and about two months, which gives you a total of 10 years and change. I always say it's about 10 years and six months, okay? About 10 and a half years, but not quite. And so... What you're seeing doesn't happen during these seven. It happens during these about three and a half years where it says the street, the city, and the wall shall be built again. Hello. Even during troublous times. Well, what did we explain happens during seals? During seals, the temple's not going to get rebuilt. Only the foundation is going to get laid. And, and we understood this by going to Jeremiah chapter, uh, Zechariah chapter 4. And we see the story here of Zerubbabel, who's laying the foundation. And it says that he's going to be the one to finish building the temple. We come to Zechariah chapter 6, and we see that we have Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus, as the Son of Man, who has many crowns, who's the high priest as Melchizedek type, 
and you have the branch who is the one who laid the temple and he's going to be the one to build it that's zerubbabel okay when does the temple actually get built he laid the foundation during seals but the temple doesn't get built until the first year of trumpets in Zechariah 8, verse 9, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong, you that hear in these days the words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. Verse 10 says, For before these days there was no man for hire, nor any beast, neither was there any peace, remember? Because at the red horse rider, peace was taken, and he what? There went out, there's no peace to him that went in or that came out or went in. Because of the affliction, for I set everyone against his neighbor. You see, red horse rider, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There was nobody to build yet until the seven years of seals were done. During the seven years of seals was this time against the Gentiles, against the world. But there's going to be a declaration after Jerusalem is destroyed to allow them to go back to rebuild. But in those seven years of seals, the only thing that's going to get built is the foundation. That's only the foundation is going to be built during the midst of these first seven years. It's these next three and about a half years when the temple and the wall, right? The city will be rebuilt and the temple of the wall will be getting rebuilt. And after these about three and a half years, Messiah, who you're going to see was here, yep, on heavenly Mount Zion, is going to be cut off. Why? Because as you're going to see, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. You're going to see the flood till the end of the war. That's about the time at about mid-trumpets when Messiah is cut off. But this is what I want to show you. Verse 27 says, And he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. That doesn't mean seven years. It means the final year. What did we have? Seven, about three and a half. So that's about 10 and a half years. Then he's cut off. What happens at this cut off? This right here, verse 26 of Daniel 9, is Revelation, uh, is Daniel chapter 12, when Satan is going to be cast out, right? Satan is going to be cast out, and it says, How long is this craziness going to go? And in Daniel 7, it says time, times, and a half. There's no and here. So there's not an addition. It means one, two, plus a half, two and a half years. To scatter the holy people, then shall it be finished. We've shared this many times. That's the uh, Revelation chapter 10. When the seventh trumpet begins to sound, the mystery of God is going to be finished. But that's just the start of the seventh year of trumpets, which means. Daniel 9 and Satan's time is only two and a half years. So what we're reading in Daniel 9.26 is the two and a half years that begins at about mid-trumpets when Messiah is cut off, when they fly on the wings of an eagle, when Satan is going to be cast down, open the pit and go after them with a the flood, like Revelation 12.14. And it says, and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined because he's going to be warring against the two witnesses for two and a half years. That's why at the end of the sixth trumpet, the two witnesses are killed. But when did the two witnesses war begin? At the fifth trumpet, when the pit was open. That war is a two and a half year war against the two witnesses. So what's the total? Seven, about three and a half, two and a half, that's 13 years. Sound familiar? That leaves what? One year. Who shows up at the end of the 13th to start the 14th year? The Lord does. It's the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives like Zechariah 14 to start that 14th year. What is he doing? Of course, he's confirming the covenant that he made six years earlier that he made at the very end of seals to the start of trumpets, but that he had to break because Satan was cast down and the pit was opened at the time when he gets cut off. 
How do you know this? You guys know how we know it. It's also given to us in Zechariah chapter 11. So in chapter 8, they start rebuilding the temple. By chapter 11, Satan, the vintage of old, is cast down. <clears throat> and what do we see? It's all over the place here. Verse 11, I'm uh, sorry, verse 10 of Zechariah 11. And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder that I may, that I may break my covenant, which I had made with all people, and it was broken in that day. Okay? We see the 30 pieces of silver without going into it. We can't go into absolutely every detail. If I go into every detail, we'd be here till Friday. We, what are we? We're, we're Saturday. We'd be here till Tuesday, going eight hours a day. But this is that 30 pieces of silver. This is the direct connection to Matthew and why only Matthew's gospel talks about the number of money, the pieces of money. Luke doesn't, Mark doesn't, only Matthew does because Matthew's is the seven years of trumpets and it's the picture of Messiah being cut off for the 30 pieces of silver. This is the Antichrist being come back. This is Satan being cut, come, uh, cast down. This is when Messiah is cut off and he breaks his covenant. That's why in Daniel chapter 9, 27, he's renewing his covenant when? at the end of 13 years. Remember, it's the story of the 20th year with Jacob and Laban. It's the story of 13 years with Ishmael and then Isaac. It's the story, it's the same story. It is the revelation of 14 years. And the Lord has returned at the beginning of this one to restore and to renew and to correct and to bring about the destruction on the enemies in the 14th year. He renews that covenant that he made at the very end of the seventh seal to the start, very beginning of the eighth. And that's why he's confirming the covenant in that 13th year. It's awesome. It's so, so awesome to see and to understand these things, guys. Can you see the 14 is everywhere? The big picture 20 and then the 21st year, the 13 and then the 14th. It, it even goes back to creation, but you can watch the Fractals video for that after you, after you begin to understand these things. So let's go back into this portion of seals in Mark's discourse, okay? We saw this abomination of desolation when they're now to flee, okay? Now they're to flee to the mountains. Go to the wilderness, flee to the mountains. What time is this? This is the Antichrist time. So now we're back in at that point of about two and a half years in seals. And what happens is we see from Revelation chapter 13, which was from chapter 12, when Satan, when the dragon, is going to give him his power and his seat and his authority. And what do we see happens? In verse 5, it says, in Revelation 13, verse 5, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him, listen to this, to continue 42 months. You see? That means he was here. He didn't have the power of the Antichrist. He didn't have the full authority yet. But now he's given that power in a greater position of authority by the dragon for 42 months. And we can show the timing by understanding the word from pain before the dragon shows up in that sign to give him the authority. This is the point in which Mark's discourse takes place and they're now to flee. This is when the world of Christians who were being saved and persecuted during the first two and a half years are now going to flee, hide out. They're going to be places of refuge and protection all throughout the earth. The Lord will even blind the enemy in cases all over the place because of the technology and the drones and all of these abilities, heat seeking, everything else, that they will be blinded to these things. 
you got to remember, we're going to be not only in the midst of the worst time in human history, we're going to be in the midst of the most miraculous time in human history. God is going to give an anointing, a power, and an authority as he has never yet given to men in all of history. Greater than they had when he gave it to them when he was first here. Do you understand why? Because it's going to be worse than it ever was since the creation. So there's going to be hope, but people must be obedient. They must be faithful. They must be diligent in the Lord. Okay? They must be in praise and, and giving thanks. Loving each other, protecting each other, helping each other. Right? So, look at what we see. Now is the time that they got to flee. Now is the time of the mark of the beast, which is the abomination in Mark's discourse. And of course, that's exactly what we see. Here's the second beast who is representative of the false prophet. And of course, we see that the mark of the beast comes. You see, this is the mark of the beast. And this is the one going to the world, to the church, the, the Gentiles grafted in with the house of Israel during the time of the Gentiles, the time of seals. <coughs> it's the 42 months from about two and a half years into seals to the end of the sixth year of seals when the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion. This is the mark of the beast on the hand or on the forehead. Okay. And we can show the timing. Because when he comes, remember, he's got the power of the leopard, the bear, and the lion. <coughs> and when we go to Daniel chapter 7, we see right here in the lion who comes first, the bear who comes second. That's the destroyer of the Gentiles who's coming, by the way. Okay? All you have to go do is read Deuteronomy 28, and you're going to freak out. That's the bear. That is Russia coming, a language they can't speak, maybe even China with them. and sayonara okay and look what happens we have the lion first then the bear then the leopard i've explained it as syria russia everybody knows that and the leopard is the control center in europe that is where the the power hub of is going to be and then look at what the fourth beast is the fourth beast <coughs> had great iron teeth it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet this is exactly what we read in, watch this, and stamped the residue in the feet, which means it's after the period of the lion, the bear, and the leopard, and their portion during the first two and a half years. When he shows up, he's going to take control over all three of them. He is going to be the power now given to this control over all three. And what is he going to do? Well, look at what it says. It was diverse from all the beasts, and it had ten horns. And what does it say? Stamp the residue with the feet. Go to Revelation chapter 11. And in Revelation chapter 11, listen to what it says. Remember we said it's correlated to the time of the 42 months when Antichrist is given that power, when the beast is given power at the time of the 42 months? Listen to verse 2. Uh, Revelation 11 verse 2. And the court which is without the temple leave out. This is talking the body. And measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall be tread underfoot 42 months. You see, the 42 months is the three and a half months remaining to the end of the sixth year of seals. And we can prove it. Okay, we'll go back to Daniel 7. The lion, the bear, and the leopard are all the first two and a half years. When the beast comes, that's the power being given for 42 months. He will take control over all of them. He's now going to have this power for a while, which will be 42 months, as we saw, treading them underfoot. Until what? Until the Ancient of Days did come. You see that? Until the Ancient of Days did come. This is the father with the son coming on heavenly Mount Zion at the end of the sixth seal. This is why the end of the sixth seal says, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, comma, and from the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come. 
This is the end of the sixth year of seals. The, the father and the son and so forth, they've all been gathered back together. And look at, look at the description of it. It's wild. And then in verse Daniel 7, 11, it says, And I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, um, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominions taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. This is the end of seals. You see, the beast, the Antichrist, the system is destroyed. But the other beasts, their power, their authority, their dominion is all taken away. Well, isn't that amazing? <clears throat> this is one of the things I love to show. We saw in the first portion of seals from Mark's discourse, starting in verse 8, nation against nation, there's no mention of antichrists or false prophets. Then you've got the abomination of desolation, the mark of the beast coming, worse than it's been since the creation till this time, and false Christ, false prophet shows up. Okay? They're now in that power and they have that authority for what? For 42 months. At the end of 42 months, look at what Mark's discourse says, verse 24. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. The stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Just go read Revelation 6 at the end of the sixth seal. Okay, the stars of heaven shall fall. Well, let's go have a look. Let's go confirm this for ourselves. Revelation chapter 6, the time of the sixth seal that, that the king is saying is going to be the time of devastation because of, because of global warming. No, it ain't. Listen to what it says. Here's the sixth seal. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Sound familiar? Darn right. Because now this is coming to the end of the 42 months of the Antichrist reign and the false prophet. You see, there it is right there. And the stars of heaven shall fall. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in, okay, which means in the clouds with great power and glory. But you see, they're going to see him coming at the end of the sixth seal, just like the world did. They're hiding in the rocks and in the caves. But the problem is they don't know, you see. But of this day and hour, right, this day and hour that no one knows, do you notice that Luke's discourse tells you nothing about the days of Noah? Hello. Only Matthew's does. You see, but why does it say, but of that day and hour, no one knows in Mark? If it's supposed to be different than Matthew's. Watch this. The story of the transfiguration is the story also in Luke, Mark, and Matthew is a pre-mid post or the 40 days the Son of Man coming the Son of Man coming at the end of the sixth seal and the Son of Man and the Lord, like the Lord coming at the end of the sixth year of trumpets. That is the transfiguration story of Luke, Mark, and Matthew. Him coming for 40 days, him coming at the end of the sixth seal, him coming at the end of the seventh seal. And look at what it says in Mark. It says in Mark 9, 1, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen, past tense, the kingdom of God come with power. Funny, right? You don't get that in Luke's. Luke said, the next thing you're going to see, bam, is the kingdom of God. Why? Because you're going to be in it. Have seen. These are past tense words. And the reason for it is because the whole world will see this coming at the end of the sixth seal. And when they see him coming, at the end of the sixth seal, and the world is going into the rocks and mountains, fall on us, hide us. You see, they're still not yet going in the rapture. They don't know exactly when it's going to happen yet. Because you can see it when you go to Revelation chapter 7. We know at the end of the sixth seal, there he was. What happens at the beginning of Revelation 7? Before all this other craziness, you're going to have the 144,000 get sealed. The 144,000, the reason they're being sealed first is they're going to help the remnant worker, servant, bride, the, the uh, um, Smyrna group. They're going to help bring them 
in. So the 144,000 are going to help the Smyrna group because there's not very many of them, right? They need more workers sent out. These guys are going to help bring in the great multitude rapture. And here it is. Now you see the great multitude rapture. It's going to happen in the seventh year of seals, about between the fifth and seventh months, somewhere in there. They don't know exactly when, but they have seen him coming. They saw it coming, but they won't know exactly when they're going. You see, so this is what happens to the time of the rapture. But what about what happens to, isn't there going to be a battle? Isn't there going to be a war that happens at the end of the sixth seal? Right? Because we just read in Daniel chapter 7 that when the beast is destroyed and all the others have their dominion taken away, we see the ancient of days that came. So this is them coming on heavenly Mount Zion. This isn't feet down on the Mount of Olives. This is why it's awesome. Whenever you see people teaching in Second Esdras and they say, and he shall stand on Mount Zion and it shall come to be prepared and built. As you saw, a mountain carved without hand. That's not coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. This is him coming at the end of seals on heavenly Mount Zion. He's coming with paradise. This is what's happening here in Daniel 7. And then look at what it says. <clears throat> Daniel 7 verse 13. And I saw in the night vision and beheld one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. This is the end of the sixth seal, brothers and sisters. Antichrist is killed. The beast is killed. But the other ones had their dominion taken away, but they weren't killed. So what happened during this battle? It wasn't just the Antichrist killed. There was a huge battle that took place. That battle is the Ezekiel 39 battle. And look at what we see. We know it's the, the Gog battle. And what happens at the end of that battle? It's sometime at the end of the sixth year of seals when he returns and he's destroyed them. We read about it right here. And in innumerable, uh, uh, so they'll leave the own land and the warfare they had against one another. And in innumerable multitude shall be gathered together as you saw, desiring to come to Conkham. But he shall be made, uh, but he shall stand on top of Mount Zion. And Zion shall come to be made manifest, prepared and built as you saw, a mountain carved without hand. And he's what? Going to destroy them with flame and destroying with the law, with, with the word, with the voice, right? And look at what happens. And they that dwell in the city of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons and the shields and the bucklers and the bows and the arrows and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. You want to understand the understanding to how they can burn them for seven years is because it's the end of the sixth year of seals when that battle happens where he destroys the Antichrist in the Ezekiel 39 war and all those that gathered against him. Then what happens? You have the seventh year of seals. Then you have the first year of trumpets, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. So six years of trumpets and one year of seals is what? Seven years of burning weapons. Following? Seven years of burning weapons. But here's another piece of insight. Check this out. I, Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 12. And seven months shall the house of Israel. Who are those going in the rapture? The house of Israel is, are the ones going in the rapture. It's the house of Israel, right? It's the great multi. Remember, it's the world, which is the Gentiles grafted in with the house of Israel. They're the ones scattered throughout the earth. The house of Israel, what? The 10 tribes? Well, guess what? That's exactly what you read right here on Mount Zion. And then he gathers unto himself a multitude that's peaceable. They are the 10 tribes which were led away by the king of Assyria. Okay? House of Israel. They're going to be what? They're going to be bearing the bones of all the dead that were in the land from that Ezekiel 39 war. They're going to be bearing bones for seven months. There's some insight, which means in that seventh year of seals, here's the question. 
in the seventh year of seals, does that mean in five months the rapture then takes place and then for the next seven months they're burying bones? Aha, maybe that's it, right? If they're burying bones, the rapture group is burying bones for seven months, then maybe they were brought in first in the rapture and then for the next seven months were burying bones or they're burying bones for seven months and then the great multitude rapture. But if they're all going to be brought there because they're the house of Israel now, right? The Gentiles grafted in, then it would seem like they're raptured in the fifth month, right? Helped with the 144,000 and the workers from seals. And then they're going to be bearing bones for seven months. What does this bring us to? This brings us to the end of the age of the Gentiles. The church age is now over. When the seventh year of seals comes to an end, we now see that Antichrist has been killed. There was the Ezekiel, uh, uh, the, the, Gog, Mag, the, the Magog War, and seven years of burning weapons, seven months of burying the people. And in those seven years of burning weapons, we also saw that we know from Luke chapter, um, Luke chapter 20 or 22, is that um, the Lord had asked his disciples, uh, for all of them to go get a sword, right? That funny story I love to say. And the Lord, they turn around, they talk amongst themselves and like, oh, I got one. I got, you got one? No, I don't have one. Do you have one? No, I don't have one. Oh man, we only got two. So they have the two and they turn around to the Lord and they say, Lord, we have two. And he's like, all right, that's good. You see, it's, it's a funny story to read, but the, the prophetic implication of it is there are two swords because one is the Ezekiel 39 war and the other one is the war in the 14th year. This is the one is a battle and one is a war. You know, you may have won the war, but I'll win the battle or however that works. Because there's one here and then there's another one that takes place here. You even see it in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 17, you see Lord of Lords and King of, uh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And it's only uppercase L, uppercase K. Then you go to chapter 19 when he's coming at the great wine press at the wrath of the Almighty God. It's all uppercase, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's the difference between the two battles that are taking place. And so what you find, this is your Ezekiel one. And what do we know happened now that we were at the end of Mark's discourse and we saw this great multitude rapture take place? We, we saw that it was the Son of Man coming. Now what's going to happen? Well, Antichrist is killed, right? Now you got Antichrist is killed, but false prophet wasn't killed. You see? Antichrist is killed, false prophet isn't killed. When we go to Zechariah chapter 8, which is now what? It's the picture of now the beginning of the seven years of trumpets. You got to remember the Jews and the house of Judah is also going to come in at this time. After the great multitude rapture, they're going to come in at this time as well. Because this is why the Christians get so confused and the church is so confused in their seven year understanding because they only believe in the seven years that's to the Jews. But they read seals and they read the implication of these events that are going to take place in Daniel and everything else. And so they smash it all together in the seven years of Jacob's trouble. And so they think that the, that the Jews are going to believe the Antichrist. That the Antichrist is going to build the temple, then declare himself God in it. It's not true. It's vastly furthest you can possibly be from the truth because it's Christ, not Antichrist, who's going to be there during the time of the rebuilding of the temple with Zerubbabel, whoever the modern day Zerubbabel is. That's exactly what's going to happen. Because you got to remember, the Jews, and this is why Christians are against the Jews. Because Christians say Antichrist is going to build the temple. Then he's going to declare himself in it to be God. So the Jews then are going to fall for the Antichrist because the temple is going to be, be built first. And they're going to fall for him because he's going to be the one to build it. But that's not the way it happens. You see, when the trumpets, when trumpets begins... The Lord has come on heavenly Mount Zion. He's destroyed their enemies that destroyed them. 
And now he's going to start to rebuild the temple there with Zerubbabel. He's going to be high priest and Zerubbabel is going to be the branch that rebuilds. This is what the Jews are looking for. The Jews are expecting that the Messiah, their Messiah who comes, is going to destroy the enemies of Israel and rebuild the temple. We just showed you and laid it out here and have been teaching it for several years now that that is the end of seals at the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion and then at the start of trumpets when the rebuilding takes place. And once you know it, it's exactly how Zechariah 8, the beginning of trumpet starts, when the Lord says he was jealous. He's no longer jealous, but he was jealous for them. See, and it says, verse 2, Zechariah 8, verse 3. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. What does he do? Verse, um, starting in verse 8, and I will bring them and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and they shall be called my people and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong like we shared earlier, right? Ye that hear in these days, uh, these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. Why couldn't it be built for seven years earlier? Because I brought affliction, neighbor against neighbor, people against people, nation against nation. Look at what verse eight says. And it shall come to pass that as Ye were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah. That means they're there now too. And house of Israel, okay, the world, the, the rapture group. So will I save you and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, let your hands be strong. Okay, so we also see that the house of Judah is there as well. Because if anybody talks to a Jew, if you study and, and talk to, to Jews that study and the rabbis, you will know that they are looking for a Messiah who will destroy the enemies of Israel that, is, that destroy them and will build the temple. The Christians say, ah, too bad for you guys because it's going to be the Antichrist and he is going to rebuild the temple. You see what they missed? They missed the entire first seven years which is to them. They missed the entire first seven years, which is Mark's gospel. Hello, you following that? They missed the first seven years. And we understand why. That's why that video in the, in the intro about it's all because of Matthew is such a huge deal. Here we have the rebuilding taking place. Well, guess what? Remember we were saying we know Antichrist is killed. The beast was killed at the end of his 42 months. It was the son of man coming on heavenly Mount Zion. We saw heavenly Mount Zion and the Lord on Mount Zion. Now, when we go to Matthew's discourse, look at what we see in the first half of Matthew's discourse. Okay, there's the nation against nation. This is the beginning for them too, okay? It's the beginning for the whole world, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. They're also going to have pestilence. To understand this, you want to go to Leviticus chapter 26. In Leviticus 26, you see what happens for their disobedience of not having been observant when they had the land. So that is why they must be removed from it for seven years for their disobedience because the Lord God cannot and will not build his temple on defiled land without it first resting for seven years. Okay, now look what happens. In the first half of Matthew 24, before the abomination of desolation in Matthew, Mark had no false prophets or false Christs. Okay, no antichrist, no false prophet until the time of the abomination of desolation, which was the mark of the beast and they were to flee. We know, as I just showed, at the end of the sixth seal from Daniel 7, we could see that the beast, that Antichrist, is killed. But the false prophet wasn't. So isn't it funny that 
in Matthew's discourse, the first half of trumpets, the only one that's mentioned is in Matthew 24, 11, and many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many, but there's no false Christ. Ta-da, because he's gone, right? This is why uh, Revelation chapter 17 says that the beast who was and is not yet shall be and come out of the pit. You see, because he was for the 42 months, he is not during the first half of trumpets. And then at mid trumpets, when Messiah is cut off, then he shall be again when he what? Comes out of the pit, which is exactly what the fifth trumpet is all about. The beginning of the two and a half years of the final three and a half years of trumpets. Okay, so now only the false prophet is here. We know that the temple is now being rebuilt. So what happens in the 11th year, which is about 10 and a half years in, as we've been talking about earlier? There's an abomination of desolation again that takes place. But this one says, stand in the holy place. Not where it is not not. You see, because why? The Lord is now there. The temple was rebuilt. So where is this in the holy place going to be? It's going to be in the rebuilt temple. This is when Messiah is cut off. This is when the fifth trumpet, when the, when the star is cast down and the pit is open. This is why Revelation 17 said, was, is not, and shall be. The shall be is when he comes out of the pit as the son of perdition. This is, this is why Matthew has the 30 pieces of silver described in it. And why Zechariah chapter 11, which is what? About 10 and a half years, right? From the beginning of tribulation or about three and a half years into trumpets after the city and streets and temple have been built. And what happens? It's the time when Messiah is going to be cut off. When he's the, the, the typology of the deception for 30 pieces of silver. You see. That means in the fourth year of seals, the foundation was laid. Then nothing happened for the rest of seals. At the start of trumpets, this, the, the, the walls and the temple are built. And in from the fourth year of seals, which is about three and a half years in when it's done, right, for the foundation, to the time of about mid uh, trumpets is seven years. To complete building but the second half of seals there was no building taking place the the temple and all of that didn't start until the beginning of trumpets this is why we have this great piece of scripture in first kings chapter 6 or second kings first kings chapter 6 verse 37 and 38 in the fourth year was the foundation of the lord laid in the month of ziph and in the 11th which is about 10 and a half years in the Mount of Bull, in the eighth month, was the house finished. It was seven years in building it. Ta-da! How much more clear do we have to get? It's right here. You want to see the fourth year? It's right there in Zechariah chapter 4 of 14 chapters. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands shall also finish it. Chapter 4 of the 14 years, and what? See, then you got your 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, okay? Mid, about three and a half years, to mid, about three and a half years, seven years, which means what? The temple was rebuilt and finished, and then what? Cut off. Cut off, breaks his covenant that he had made because Satan has now been cast down and the pit is open. Want to know why that's fascinating? Because when you get to Matthew 24, I'm going to try to finish this as fast as I can. When we get to Matthew 24 and this abomination of desolation that is in the temple and now there to flee, which is the revelation Chapter 12, verse 14, when they fly onto the wings of an eagle into the place protected 
which is Psalms 90 and 10, which is a picture of the 14 years, which says from 70 to 80, that's 10 years, then it is soon cut off. That's about 10 and a half years. And we fly away. That is mid trumpets flying away. Revelation 12, 14. It is also the Daniel 9 Messiah being cut off about 10 and a half years. It's the same time as Daniel chapter 12, time times and a half. It's two and a half years of the final three and a half years to bring it to the end of 13 years. But those that fly away on wings of an eagle that are protected until the end of the 14 years, they're the ones that fly away on the wings of an eagle at this abomination here, at the temple destruction. And what do we see happen? We know that they're going to remain there till the end of 13th, the, the 14th year, which is three and a half years. But Satan's time with the Antichrist back, false prophets still there. Satan has now been cast down to the earth, just like Revelation 12 says at that time. Look what happens. False Christs and false prophets. So we went from Mark, first half, no false Christ, no false prophets. They're on the scene, but the power isn't given to them yet. Then at the abomination of desolation in Mark, which is the mark of the beast in the flesh, then you've got false Christ and false prophets. We know at the end of six year of seals, Antichrist is killed, but the false prophet isn't. And in the first part of trumpets in Matthew 24, you've got no Antichrist, but you've got false prophet because it's the time of him being is not. The temple is now complete. Satan has been cast down. He's going to be given two and a half years of the final three and a half years. The pit is going to be open. The son of perdition is going to come out of the pit. And what do you have? False Christ and false prophets. Now the Antichrist has come back on the scene. You following? This is unbelievable. And then remember what we said in Luke 17? In Luke chapter 17, it said in verse 24 that it will be as lightning from one end unto his other when he comes in his day, but first. Remember that? So he starts with the end and then he says, but first. And that started everything from the above 14 years portion. Well, look at what it says here. <clears throat> now we know this is what? He's about to come at the end. You see? He's coming now at the end of tribulation in his day. And look at what it says in verse 27. Matthew 24, verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so also is the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. You get it? Are you following? This isn't, by the way, this isn't even the end of the 14th year. This is the end of the 13th year. How do you know? Because look at this. No man knows the day or hour. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So in Luke 17, it was one way to show us the 40 days and the big picture of seven and seven, giving us a big overview picture. But in Matthew 24, verse 36, uh, uh, verse 38, or, or 37 and 38, this days of Noah is a picture of the Lord here for the final year. 13 years are done when he comes as lightning from one end unto the other immediately after the tribulation of those days. This is at the end of the sixth trumpet. And the beginning of the seventh trumpet is going to be as it was in the days of Noah. What is the story of the days of Noah? The overall picture is a one-year story. Hence, this is the end of the 13th year, at the beginning of the 14th year. It's going to be devastation and destruction during that final year by the Lord. It's going to be the second sword. Remember, they burnt the weapons for seven years. What was the seven years? The last year of seals, six years of trumpets. So what are they going to do? Beat their, 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 um, 
their plowshares back in to weapons. They beat their weapons into plowshares and pruning hooks. Then they're going to take them and bring them back. Just like the scripture says. And that is Zechariah chapter 14. When he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. And listen to what it says in Zechariah 14 verse 2. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken. See, remember there's a destruction still coming in that final year. And the houses shall be rifled. The, the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Huh. Sound familiar like, like the story of Noah in Matthew 24? Look, listen to verse 3. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Hello. What was the as when he fought in the day of battle? It was the end of seals at the Ezekiel 39 war. Ta-da! Verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the mist toward the east and toward the west. Okay? Then you see all the devastation. Their, their eyes are going to melt in their sockets. The tongues are going to melt in their mouth. This is that final year. You see, what is he doing during this final year? He is preparing the land. Remember, like he's preparing a place in his father's house. He's now going to then prepare Jerusalem, destroy everything that came against it, renew it and refresh it. And what is he going to do at the end of that 14th year, that final year? He's going to bring those who were in the wilderness at the, till the end of the final three and a half years. He will then bring them back and it will be the final jubilee where all the land will be restored, each one to their tribe, exactly as Ezekiel chapter 48 tells us, each land, each tribe receiving their land, brothers and sisters. That is the final jubilee year, the big picture jubilee year after the 14th year where he has to renew and prepare a place. He's going to repair and prepare, destroy what's there and prepare a place in Jerusalem. This is why going back to Matthew chapter 24, that final year, which is as Noah, right? What's the story as Noah? Listen to what it says. Uh, da -da -da -da. Listen to what it says, verse 39 of Matthew 24. This final year is what this represents. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Listen to this. Then shall two be in the field, and one be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, and the other left. What did Zechariah 14 say? Zechariah 14, this exact same representation of that year, listen to what it said. And half of the city shall go into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Half. What's two minus one? Half. What is the representation? The final 14th year, the flood year representation as the image of the flood, not the picture of the overall story of the above and 14 years that Luke 17 was talking about. Now look what happens. Bring this to an end by going to Matthew 25. Now you have the story of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is where the third heaven is. The kingdom of God is where paradise is. There are two places within paradise. The kingdom of heaven is the promise to the Jews of their kingdom on earth, their millennial reign promise. Listen to this. Now you have the foolish and the wise virgins, and now you have the story of the bridegroom 
and the wedding that comes at the end of what? The 14th year, just like the story of Jews, a contract at the beginning, she's of age at 13, they're married, but, but just legally, he prepares a place. When he completes the pre preparation of that place, he brings her to where he is, to the place prepared. And when he comes, here he is as the bridegroom coming. The door shut to the marriage. Half of them were ready, half of them weren't. Brothers and sisters, this is the revelation. And there is so much more. I, I could talk till I can't talk anymore. I've tried to cover as much as I can within a reasonable amount of time, and I'm already at three hours and 40 minutes. Brothers and sisters, it's an awesome story. The revelation is revealed, and this is why I say, once it begins, we have the revelation of the story. We don't have every intricate detail. That is the power and the understanding and the knowledge that he is going to give his remnant workers and the apostles. They will have the understanding open. They will have the completed story of the Antichrist and who it is. They will know. They will, they will have all sorts of abilities just as he had. You see, the entire story here, here in Revelation 12, 9, this is when Satan is cast down. This is Zechariah chapter 11. This is the fifth trumpet when the pit is open this is when daniel 12 uh daniel 9 well it's also daniel 12 with how long will this be time at time times and a half and it's also when messiah is cut off when messiah is cut off because the people the prince that shall come destroy and go after them with a flood what does he go after them with at the beginning of the first of the final three and a half years of trumpets he goes after them with what he goes after them, where is it? He goes after them with water as of a flood. You see, they fly away on the wings of an eagle. This is at the sixth trumpet, uh, sorry, the fifth trumpet, which is the first woe. It's so awesome. Who does he make war with? For two and a half years, He's going to be making war against the two witnesses. You see, he's cast down, Satan's cast down. When the two witnesses finish their testimony, which is the uh, first half of trumpets, it says the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. But it takes two and a half years before he kills them, which is why we see them killed at the end of the sixth seal, brothers and sisters. Here is the 14th year beginning. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Unbelievable. Man, I would, you guys know me. I, I would love to do this for another two hours and just lay more of this story out from more pieces of the Gospels, from more of Genesis, from more of Revelation, from more of Daniel, Zechariah, Jeremiah, Kings, Chronicles, uh, Hebrew, I mean, everywhere. Brothers and sisters, we have it. The revelation has been revealed, and once it begins, who do you think has the playbook? Do you see why it's highly probable a number of people in this ministry are going to be chosen as his remnant workers? You don't reveal the playbook to a group of people and then say, see you later. I'm going to go now give it to these guys. But don't be fearful. If it's not something you want to do, the Lord won't choose you for it. If he chooses you, he knows you can do it. Does it freak me out sometimes? Heck yes, it freaks me out. But am I fearful of it? No, man, because we of all people in the revelation understand much of the revelation of the cost that's coming in it. We know what it means. We know we'd have to put our necks on the lines if need be. But we know that we also will have no more faith 
because we will have been in the literal presence of the Son of Man. Empowered, filled with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of the end. You following? Being given the incredible power of the Holy Ghost on Pentecost. Translated to Jerusalem. Having a meal where he is going to sit down with us and serve us. This will not be any ordinary power. This will not be any ordinary authority. Even over the greatness of the powers in the authorities given in history. This is going to be a period of time such as never was before, nor, nor shall ever be again. And with that is the necessity of the power as it has never been before. You will take part in the greatest revival in human history. It will be filled with tears of joy and filled with tears of sadness. It will be the greatest time, it will be the hardest time. But you will understand it. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. Please remember to support if you can. Pray for us always and for the ministry and over each other. Intercede for us if you can. Please continue to pray over us. The enemy must be aware that this is happening, but I know we're protected. That's why we're continuing and able to continue to make it bring uh, to bring it forward. Continue to intercede for Steve and for his team and everyone like him throughout the ministry that is working, that it, that is putting him forward, that is sharing, that is that are praying for others even and for their families and for each other. Brothers and sisters, I love you with all my heart. I cannot wait to meet you and your families. I'm so excited. But I'm also cautiously. <laughs> okay. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. Bye for now. Talk to you soon.